good. So if you just want to... Yeah, I'll, I'll get set up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe the first line or two. Uh, well, this is uh, fun. Hello, everyone. Hey. Uh, we could start right now, but I think I'll wait. Thanks very much.
Hello, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. Um, I am very happy to introduce our next speaker. We have Richard Sterling. Since 2008, Richard has been at the heart of transparency and open data initiatives in the UK. Within government, Richard helped shape the current transparency agenda, created data.gov.uk, and the world's first online competition for government data, showusabetterway.com. He is now international director at the Open Data Institute, committed to catalyzing the evolution of open data culture to create economic, environmental, and social value. His lecture today is focused on, on creating impact from open data. Please welcome to the stage, Richard Sterling. Good afternoon. Uh, so, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so, I'm here to talk to you about uh, how to create impact from open data, and yeah, a little bit about the ODI. Um, you know, the Open Data Institute. Here, we're here to catalyze the evolution of open data culture to create economic, environmental, and social value. Um, now, what that really means is it kind of means opening, answering the so what question for open data. You know, and we, re we really believe that open data is something that can have real impact for everybody because we think it's a tool, not necessarily an end in and of itself. And when I say impact, uh, you know, this is for everybody, you know, slightly cheating, using a picture of uh, Sir Tim uh, opening at the opening of the Olympics. Um, I, I mean, it can have impact across all the sectors. So, uh, you know, you can have open data powered culture. culture. You know, one of the first things that uh, our chief executive, Gavin Starks, did when he, he joined the organization was he created uh, the world's first data as culture art commission. You know, brought in respondents from other countries, uh, um, uh, actually quite a staggering amount of uh, coverage. Powering things like this, this chap here. Every single light in this uh, thing is powered by a different sensor uh, in this guy's house. And my personal favorite, uh, this is the snack machine in the ODI. Uh, this does not accept money. This only dispenses crisps when, or chips when uh, there is bad financial news in the economy. You know, it mines all the headlines from BBC, from Reuters. Uh, and whenever someone's, you know, there's a headline, like 10,000 people sacked uh, or laid off due to the downturn, then crisps fall out to cheer you up. Uh, this was a great snack machine a couple of years ago. Turns out it's, it's, it's less good in the, the upturn. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, budget bingo has got slightly more boring recently. Uh, we, we need to go back to the artist and try and refigure what was the data that drives this. Um, but it can also, you know, be a, a driver for efficiency savings. So I think uh, Victor, one of the previous speakers, uh, mentioned this. You know, op uh, open data identified a 200 million cash saving uh, in the NHS from switching from branded to generic drugs in one line. Now this is something that wasn't news to the sector. The whole debate about uh, branded versus generics and care pathways and all, all of that stuff has been going on for uh, years in the NHS because nobody likes wasting money. Um, this was the first time that you could look at a map and go, well, there doesn't seem to be any real correlation with things that you would expect. You know, it's not like the spending on branded drugs is particularly in London. So there's no sort of urban rural split. You can't identify the country, the major cities around the UK on this map. There's no particular north-south split. Um, there is a cluster in the northeast. Uh, anecdotally, that's uh, around um, particularly good uh, drugs rep, uh, who's, who's very good at selling. Um, but if, if, you, if you believe that this is just random noise, then this is a 200 million cash saving identified by, in the NHS at a time when the NHS is strapped for money and strapped for cash uh, for roughly the same clinical outcome. Um, 
Now, success would be if I was able to stand here and say, and yes, we did this in six weeks with one of our startup companies, Open Healthcare, uh, as part of the partnership, Ben Goldacre in there to make sure it was all active. And now the NHS is using this service. You know, having found a 200 million cash saving, the NHS picked up the phone and said, you know what, we want to buy that off you. Can we take that insight? And do you mind doing this for another 20 different classes of uh, drugs? Uh, and that will be our phase one program. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, it is starting, you know, about 18 months after we did, after the analysis happened, it's starting to happen. Next example I want to talk to you about is uh, in the world of regulation. You know, I mentioned on the panel uh, just before lunch um, that open data has the power to transform how th markets are regulated. Now, this is uh, a map um, which shows you uh, how the world looks according to Goldman Sachs. You know, every single point on this map is a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. They have a, at least a 50% equity holding. The data powering that comes from three different regulators across the United States. So no one regulator in the States could do this analysis. Um, but because of the presumption of open, all the data is there. And you can, if you look at the map, you can see some of the major countries there. You know, I can identify the USA, there's uh, the UK hiding underneath a cluster. There's uh, islands. Uh, I think it's Holland that's hiding under that point of yellow. And that big country that looks a bit like a flexing arm, uh, that's the Cayman Islands. Uh, that's the first time I knew the Cayman Islands looked like a, a flexing arm. Knew Italy looked like a boot. Didn't know the Cayman Islands looked like that. And I will leave you to draw your own conclusions as to why the Cayman Islands is about half the size of the United States in terms of uh, Goldman Sachs corporate structure, but this is the, 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 the insight here is that this was the first time all of that information had been brought together, and it was able to be brought together because all three of those regulators was publishing it as open data. Open Corporates, the company that did this analysis, they didn't need to ask anyone's permission, they could just do it. Continuing on the regulatory theme, uh, another thing that's really powerful is being able to use open data to have a grown-up relationship between the industry and with uh, the regulator. Now, this is some analysis we did last year. Uh, we did this ourselves rather than with one of our, uh, one of our startup companies. Uh, and we did this in partnership with the Bank of England and the peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, but just in case, 10 years ago, the peer-to-peer -peer lenders went to the Treasury, the Bank of England, uh, all of the, the FSA as it was, um, and said, hey, it's just people lending to people direct on the internet. We do not need to be regulated as a bank. It's, it'll be fine. There aren't very many people. We'll let you know if it all goes wrong. And uh, they did manage to get themselves a new light touch regulatory regime for this new innovation online. And it's been massively successful. In the last 10 years, there's been double-digit growth in this industry to the point where Zopa now have 1% of the retail loan market, and they still have that double-digit growth. So it's not going to take them another 10 years to get to 10%. Um, and the regulator was kind of looking at this and going, well, hold on, you said this was small. Uh, this is now a meaningful amount of money. Um, do we need to increase the amount of regulation? Possibly to the level of banks. And, you know, bank regulation very effective in the UK. Uh, we definitely didn't have to bail them all out. And it's been so effective, there's been no new entrance in uh, the bank industry in, I think, about 80 years until two started last year. Um, so what we did was we went, well, this is an interesting problem. You know, Bank of England thinks about, is thinking about increasing regulation. Bet the peer-to-peer -peer lenders aren't, aren't keen on this. Is there an open data solution? So we, we, we spoke to the lenders, and we, we found one. You know, we found, uh, they opened up data from their loan book. We analyzed it. And you, know, you could see, at a glance, what was going on in the market, to the point where the Bank of England, if they wanted it, could have had a, a big screen on their wall showing them real time what was the lending that was happening across the UK. Um, and to, you know, that directly fed in to them saying that the uh, regulatory regime was working. You know, this was uh, a market where they could take a data-rich, regulation-light approach. 
it can be used to uh, analyze financial flows. You know, this, this is, uh, again, one of our startup companies, Spend Network. They took uh, data from the European Union and from a number of different countries about what they were spending where, all of the tender information that was put out on EU portals, and showed that there was uh, 22 billion pounds worth of cash flow delay to the UK economy, a time when the, the UK government was saying that they were trying to buy from small business, and they were trying to make sure that the money flowed through as quickly as possible so that the cash flow supported British industry. And it can become uh, useful in uh, a sort of policy debates. You know, how often have we, we seen debates uh, where one side says this is a wonderful thing, another side says this is awful, the world is going to end, and it's completely data light. You know, there is no evidence on either side. And we, we saw uh, this type of assertion-based debate going on last year uh, with fire station closures in London. You know, it's a really emotive subject. These are uh, Because of uh, the, the, the constrained uh, position in, in public spending in the UK, you know, there are cuts needing to be made, fire stations needed to be closed, um, and this is where the fire engines come, that come and put you out when you're about to die. Um, so you, know, you had unions on one side saying this is a disaster, the GLA and mayor on the other side saying this is, it, it's, it'll all be fine. And we thought, well, let's inject some data into this, this debate. Let's, let's inject some analysis. Let's see what the answer actually is. Um, and uh, Telefonica, one of our members, they opened up their, um, their, their, their sort of aggregate telephone location data. So for the first time, we weren't just reliant on the census, where do people live, but we could say where people are. Um, so we uh, ran the numbers, you know, did, modeled it, you know, what happens if the fire stations are alive, what happens if the fire stations are closed, uh, and it turns out that actually the proposed change was a rational one. Um, but we, we were able to sort of surface that, and uh, this is quite almost like the, uh, the beginnings of what a smart city uh, could look like. But this is, you know, it's been a big year for open data. Um, it's been a year where the examples, like the ones that I've just put up, which are very UK focused, are starting to become global. You know, we're, almost, we're at a, a unique moment in the, the, the evolution of open data. You know, last year, uh, when they met, the G8 signed uh, an open data charter. They committed to opening up their data, opening up the core data sets, and uh, starting to use it. We've got emerging standards. We've got things, people, talk, people doing things like Wikidata, solving problems about versioning and uh, you know, so solving some of the technical challenges here. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing the beginnings of a global movement. So this is why um, we think it's quite important that we've uh, joined a partnership uh, for open data with the World Bank and with Open Knowledge um, to support countries and de uh, so support developing countries in joining that revolution. Support them in uh, building their capabilities. Support them in, in the choices they need to make about platforms. And also about thinking through how, what are the examples that, like, like the ones I've just put up on screen, what are those examples and use cases that they want to see emerging? Um, and this is uh, just going to a bit of, bit of detail on one of the, the countries we've worked with. Uh, this is Burkina Faso. As you can see, they do have open data. They have a big sign outside the government headquarters saying they have 17 policemen. Um, and what we did was we, we they, they approached us, they said, uh, you know, we're really interested in this open data thing, but we don't know where to start. So we went out, we, 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 we helped them, we gave them some advice, helped them create an action plan. Um, but all, all, in, all the time, empowering them to help themselves. And what they've done is they've uh, taken education as their big, as their big theme. You know? uh, they have a burgeoning education uh, sector. Uh, you know, Burkina Faso was the, the third poorest country, according to the UN. Um, so, edu you know, they're starting from a, a low base, but there are some new schools coming. Um, and that's, importantly, they had the beginnings of a data ecosystem. 
You know, so they had some data about like how many women are in this in this school. They had some information about how how good is the school, how how much uh, are they helping to bring people along. They didn't know the locations of the school. Uh, so one of those little things that we did as we went along uh, was uh, we got the military to lend the person in charge of education a GPS unit, so he could go around tagging the schools and the school locations. Uh, you may think this is silly, but you know, that was a big value add for us. Um, but once now they've got the data, they've opened it up. Uh, what they've done is they've, they've opened it up, not just so that people can have choice about their schools, but also so the donors and the people who are you know, basically building schools in Burkina Faso know where they ought to be living. Ah, OK, sorry. Uh, correction from the floor, this is not the number of policemen, this is the phone number for the policeman. Um, thank you very much. I will now amend my talk uh, for the future. Um, so, uh, yes, now they have the data about the education system. Um, they've opened it up, and they've opened it up so that the donors can see where the schools are, where they're effective, and importantly, build the schools where there are the gaps not build the schools where they've uh, seen success from someone else. Um, so this is, this is, for them, transformative in where they get inward investment. Now, as it's a, a global community that uh, is being built, then uh, we're starting to scale up uh, the ODI. We now have uh, operations in 20 countries, uh, sorry, 20, 20 different centers of operations in 14 countries and four continents around the world, uh, starting to sort of provide some of this support that we, we offer around training, around corporate membership, around startups, uh, to nurture this community of people working with open data to create impact. And that's something that we uh, you know, hope to see driving some of the changes, some of the uh, benchmarks and performance in countries in benchmarks around the world. So this is uh, something called the Open Data Barometer. There is also an Open Data Census. Uh, the census ca counts the number of data sets that are open. This is looking into um, some of the, 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 starting to get into the impact side. So um, I, I, one of the, the measures here is around, you know, how much social impact is there? How much economic impact is there? Is the environment right? Um, are the data sets created? And this is something that was done, uh, is done by the, the World Wide Web Foundation. Um, and uh, we've done a very pretty visualization, uh, which you, know, you should click in and have a look. Um, so yeah, this, this is uh, something which is global, something which is growing, something where uh, I, you know, it's, it's creating a rich firmament for people to uh, work with. And it's, uh, you know, we, what we have now is we have a unique moment. I think this is why uh, the, the, the sort of, the, the tipping point with uh, Wikidata is important. You know, Wikidata, uh, we heard from uh, Marcel just before lunch, uh, is something which enables some of the feedback loops on data to work. Yeah, it enables versioning, it enables community maintenance, it enables uh, people to, to be able to correct over time and refer back to the source material. And this is something which, if you think this is in, against a global landscape of open data and a, a global environment, something which is going to be an amazing resource into the future. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that talk. That was lovely, and you've been um, you've been a lovely audience all day. Uh, but you're not the only audience, um, lest we forget. We are streaming live. Yes, I believe so. Uh, so could we just? I would love it if we if you could all um, if we could all give a big rousing hello to the people watching across the world. Can we do that? Eh? Ready? One, two, three. Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. I know there's at least one person watching the stream because my dad has been texting me to tell me that my dress is too tight. So 
that's fine. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to have the Q&A with the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees. So if they could all make their way onto the stage, and I'll give you guys all about a minute to have just a brief leg stretch, and then we will get going with that. Thank you. Quick intermission while we assemble the rest of our crew. So I suggest that we sing or think of very good questions. You could think of very good questions while you're waiting. What else could we do? We could. Um, we could dance. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah. We could uh, dance. <laughs> We're not dancing. Yeah. The lady at the back is not allowed to make questions. Oh no. Do I get okay. To the yeah. Okay. Yes, Would please. All right. Hello. Hello. We're still missing people, no? <laughs> we were waiting backstage for that. Are we going to wait for it? Oh, she's going to eat you. We're good? Okay, I'm just going to start. Uh, hi, my name is Jan Bardavide. I'm the chair of the Wikimedia Board of Trustees. Thank you all for coming for our annual Q&A. We're a little nervous because we have competition from five other exciting tracks, but that seems to have not stopped a lot of you. Thank you. Um, basically, we have an hour in which you can ask us questions. I have two housekeeping announcements. Um, first of all, Stuart West cannot be present. He was with us for the board meeting earlier, but due to family circumstances, he had to go back to Paris. So he couldn't attend this Q&A. And Jimmy, unfortunately, due to a scheduling mistake on our end, was scheduled for both a live interview and this. Apparently, the live interview has to be live. So <laughs> that's, until, that's until 3.30, and he will join us for the last half an hour. And uh, we'll be able to answer questions, et cetera, at that time. Um, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. Um, with a, one caveat is Patricio is the new vice chair of the Board of Trustees. So congratulations. <laughs> Alice, would you like to start? So, I start. Hello, I'm Alice Wiegand, coming from Germany. I'm on the board now for two years, and I'm really glad that the board chose me to serve on the board for another two years. One of the things which really touches me and my work is to bring in the best of everyone and each individual in our movement without wasting its time, wasting energy and everything else. And that is for structures and groups and informal and formal things as well as for just the single, only and lonely writer or photographer. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Ana Toni. I also come from, I also know, I come from Brazil. <laughs> you come from Germany, I come from Brazil. I've been on the board for one year, and um, unfortunately, for personal reasons, I am uh, resigning from the board. So I'm a new and outgoing board member. Hello, I'm SJ Klein. Uh, I'm from Boston, and uh, I come from the world of libraries and archives and I'm currently chair of the art committee. So if anyone has deep questions about Wikimedia finances. Hello, my name is Maria Sefidari. I come from Madrid, Spain, and I've been on, serving on the board for the last year, so I'm one of the new members like Anna. And uh, I'm gonna be chairing the next year the board governance committee, so if you have governance questions, by all means, don't be shy. Hello, I'm Frida Brioschi, I'm from Italy. It's my second time on the Board of Trustees. Last time was in 2007, and uh, I will serve in the HR committee, and I will be one of the FDC liaison. Hello, I'm Patricio Lorente, Vice Chair of the Board. Um, I come from La Plata, Argentina. Uh, this is my second term as a uh, member of this board. Uh, I've been for the last two years, and now I've been reselected by the affiliates of our movement. And I think that's pretty old. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. My name is Phoebe Ayers. I am from California in the US. I, this is also my second term on the board, although it's a little complicated. I uh, served from 2010 to 2012, um, having been selected by the chapters and was re-elected by the community last year. So my term goes till next year. Um, I am a librarian. <coughs> and uh, I work with science and open access. Hello, I'm Bishaka. I live in Mumbai, India, and this is actually my fifth Wikimania as a board member and the fifth time I'm going to do this Q&A session, which I always look forward to. In my day job, I run a nonprofit. I make documentary films. I do some writing and lots of stuff like that. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Marr, who is our Chief Communications Officer. She'll be doing the MCing or the Master of Ceremonies, of this uh, Q&A session. This is Mike Live. Oh, fantastic. So sorry, everyone. We'd hope to be able to do this a little bit more informally without me at a podium, but it doesn't seem there are quite enough mics to be able to MC while you all speak. So the first question that we have here, and if you're in the audience and following along, please do note that these questions are available on the Wikimania 2014 site uh, under questions for the Q&A with Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees. The first question we have is, the current strategy document is for the period 2012 to 2015. In the recently published annual plan 2014 to 2015, a strategy process for the next period was abandoned. Can you elaborate on strategy planning for the moment or for, excuse me, for the movement and for WMF? So the foundation, the last time we did our five-year strategy, we developed a strategy that was somewhere between something for the foundation and something for the whole movement. And it was never exactly resolved. And since then, there have been a number of debates as early as 2010 with people wondering if there should be a separate strategy that was clearly just for the foundation. So this year, the foundation is in the middle of developing a strategy for itself, and there have been a couple of staff retreats, which will, end, which will result in a foundation strategy by the beginning of next year. And we are hoping to support whatever community processes there are to move towards a, a real strategy for the movement. Uh, that's a lot more interesting now than it was five years ago. There are probably 20 different chapters and sister projects that each have some version of a strategy. Wikisource has been developing its own. Uh, there are some individual technical projects that have very specific roadmaps. 
I don't know if anyone here uses um, some of the math plugins, math extensions, but both the music and math development communities have little roadmaps of what they want to see over the next few years. So I think we'll end up seeing a very different community process. And uh, the foundation's open to good ideas about how to facilitate that and what it should look like. But whatever the foundation does itself, that, I think that'll be the piece that looks the most like uh, the process five years ago. And it'll be a, a much smaller group, and it'll be a much more focused result. And I think it's worth noting that Lila will spend some time on this tomorrow in her key, keynote. And if not, she'll look really panicked right now, like, what? No, but she's really going to spend some time giving a little bit of the outlines of what, what it looks like. So if you'd yes, like I to know, go... I know, that's why I'm looking at her. Like, I know she's here. So from my perspective, uh, the foundation definitely needs to have a focus and understanding of where we're navigating towards. And that's why it's so critical for us to um, take care of this immediately. That said, I want us to realize that strategy, the way we understood it in the past, um, was actually a set of goals. Um, and a bit of a misnomer. Um, so I want, us to, uh, I want to actually reset expectations on what strategy is. I'm not going to do this now, but I will touch on that uh, tomorrow. And as we start um, developing and, and um, talking about it um, uh, in the public like we do with everything, uh, it will become more clear. Oh, all right, excellent. <laughs> um, so just a reminder that if you'd like to go ahead and update with another question, uh, you can freely do so on the wiki. I'll keep refreshing here to see any questions that you may add. After we've run through the questions on wiki, we'll start opening up and having questions from the audience. And my Wi-Fi just went out. Okay. <laughs> of course it did. Um, so as I recall, there was a second question that was incredibly long and actually quite complex about one particular instance. I have assurances from Jan Bart that the board will follow up with an answer to that question afterwards. And so we're going to move on to the third question on Wiki, which I hope my Wi-Fi comes back. Luckily, I remember what it is, and it's a question we're having to do with uh, internet.org and the appearance of Wikipedia content on the new internet.org product that has been launched in Zambia, and whether or not Wikipedia was involved in any way in that launch. Well, yeah, I can't hear very clearly. At this end, it's echoing, but if I hear your question correctly, Catherine, I don't think we were directly involved in a partnership, but because all the content on Wikipedia is free content anyway, we've made that available. Yeah, we're, we're not actually an official partner of internet.org, um, but we told the people behind it, including Facebook, like this is an open license project, you can use our content if you adhere to the licensing. So we're not an explicit partner, but our content is being used. There's usually a please in there. You can use our content, please. Oh, sorry, yes, please <laughs> use our content. <laughs> All right, until my Wi-Fi comes back, I think we're probably opening it up to the crowd at this point. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, do we have questions here in the audience? Surely, surely some of you have a question. There's a question down in the front. Yeah. Hello. Uh, there are signs of strategic plan for the next few years that you're planning to grow the number of staff, especially in engineering. Can you please explain what is the need you saw in making the foundation a bit bigger? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Catherine? Yeah, First, yes, we can't yes. hear them at all. Yeah, I don't think any of us can hear the, yeah. heard the question. Can you hear me all right? OK. A little bit. Not, not so well. Oh. It, OK, so. It's because the mics are echoing. Like, mm -hmm. we're having mm -hmm. feedback off the floor speakers. Just repeat it, please. OK, um, I asked, I signed the strategic plan for the next years that you're planning to make the staff bigger. I mean, add more people, especially in engineering. Can you explain, please, the reasoning behind the need to, uh, to hire more people. Would you like me to repeat that? 
So the question was that there is a plan to increase the number of staff at the foundation, especially in engineering. Could you please elaborate on the reasons behind that? Okay. <laughs> um, I think that the, the specific question with regards to how we're hiring more engineers, et cetera, is something that's it's left to the executive level. What we do see is that we're not where we want to be with regards to MediaWiki, and I think we need to, uh, that's one of the reasons why we hired an executive director who has a focus on product engineering. And she's currently sort of has a pretty crisp analysis of where we're at and, and that, uh, what's needed. And if she feels that we need to hire more engineers to solve that problem or focus in other areas, that's something she would basically execute on and within parameters set by something at the board level. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll elaborate on that too, which is um, what that stems from is saying the direction of the foundation as a technical organization. And we are a technical organization. We're an engineering organization. Um, half of our staff, correct me if I'm wrong, Lila, are um, involved in engineering and the product, which is the websites, our own projects. and. Let us not forget that we run the fifth biggest website in the world. It's a big endeavor and it's a big technical project um, and there's a lot to do on that side, um, as I think we all acknowledge. And so um, hiring more engineers is uh, a, part of, a part of that direction. Well, we're working on the technical difficulties. Um, maybe more engineers for that. <laughs> Are there other questions from the audience at the moment? Great. Uh, hello. I'd like to know your opinion on uh, Wikipedia Zero, on the principle of net neutrality. Could any of you of us elaborate on this? Yeah. In the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, it's been some debate around Wikipedia Zero and whether conflicts with the concept of net, net neutrality. And my opinion is that net neutrality refers specifically or mostly to the fact that some services or some certain companies are trying to pay to use what is called the fast lane lanes of the internet. If there are fast lanes, there are also slow lanes. And that is not the internet we want. We completely reject that possibility. In this sense, we completely support the concept of net neutrality. But, but when going to Wikipedia Zero, we are not going we are not talking about fast or slow. We are talking about people who is outside the road at all. So what we are trying is to give them access to a basic human right, which is access to information and knowledge. And I know some people don't agree with this opinion because they have a wider notion of net neutrality. And I'm sorry, but my opinion is quite different. If our concept of net neutrality prevents us to secure human rights, then we should revise the concept of net neutrality. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone have a follow-on to that? I think that was fairly well definitive. All right, um, thank you so much for the phone up here, which I don't have a passcode for. <laughs> I won't repeat that. <laughs> you guys broke the internet. Um, okay, so the next question, which is on Wiki, is what does the board expect they'll be working on in the next year? Apart, of course, from the same thing as every year, which is taking over the world. <laughs> Should there be more clear lines about the extent of the community's authority versus the foundation's authority? For example, how independent should communities be in deciding how their communities are configured? Does the Wikimedia movement need a formal constitution describing the role and authority of various groups in our movement? 
Where should we start with this yes. bunch of questions? <laughs> so maybe I just take the first lead and then someone else uh, take it over because I'm not, I wasn't able to really pick that up all. So starting with what are our main priorities during the next, the coming year? I think there are several things that really needs to be done. And the first is, we started the question round with that already, is working on the strategy. We need to focus on what we do and what we don't do to really figure out who we are and which way are we going to go during the next few years. Not only from day to day, but having really goals in front of us where we put our energy in to achieve them. That's really, really important, and that is one of our main things to work out. And it's not that it's an easy, easy task, because doing this kind of strategy, although it, it, would, it will be quite different from what we did five years ago, is a huge amount of things to do. And we have all those... Um, all those people who are interested in what we do and who are affected in, of, uh, on the things we do, they all want to have a say and they should have some option and opportunity to bring input into these, this process. And so that's one of our main priorities and now I'm glad to just reach it over. Thank you, okay, Shabu. I'm gonna try and answer the part of the question that I did hear. And please pardon me, because I can only hear up to Patricio properly. So I have, I have to be basically guess what other people are saying. But what I wanted to say is that I think for us in the year ahead, something that's particularly important is really putting in place the conditions that will ensure that we make our new executive director, Laila Tretikov, who's here on the stage with us, as effective as she can be, right? So I think there's an assumption that the board's role ends when we hire the new ED, and that is incorrect, because especially those of you who are on in the audience and are boards of other Wikimedia organizations or other organizations know, the first year is an extremely critical time for a new ED. So I think a lot, lot of our board thinking is really going to go towards determining how we as a board can effectively support her and create the conditions that can really facilitate her work. Yeah. I totally agree with Bashaka and with Alice. I think those are the priorities that we have talked about broadly in our meeting this weekend. I am going to... Um, hijack this for one second because I'm curious. If you could raise your hands in the audience if you feel like you understand what this group of people is for. Like, why does the board exist? So like, half of you? Yeah. Give or take? So I wonder if it's worth spending one minute on what we see our role in general as. Would that be useful for people? You want to raise your hands again? Useful, yes? All right, awesome. Let's do it. Do you want to take it? Okay. We are here, yeah, was that a question? Or a wave? <laughs> Hi. Um, we, uh, we are here um, as the legal entity that governs the foundation, and what that means is we hire the executive director, Lila, who we're all extraordinarily glad to have with us. We um, have a fiduciary responsibility to oversee the Wikimedia, the Wikimedia budget. Um, and our responsibility is limited because we are the board of the Wikimedia Foundation, right? Not Wikipedia, not the projects, et cetera. Um, but when we think about the future of what we want Wikimedia to do, the kinds of decisions we make are, should we be an engineering organization? How much push should we put in that direction? What should our priorities for the foundation's work be? Our job stops there, largely, and we hand it to the executive director, working with the executive director, hopefully, who then makes decisions about things like, we should hire 10 engineers, 50 engineers, 100 engineers. Um, and so when we give you a vague answer about what our direction and work this year is going to be, it's because that's the kind of work that the board is for. Um, does anyone want to 
add on to that? Yeah. So I think, I think we've answered like three of the four questions, so I'm gonna have a stab at the fourth, which was, if I heard correctly, if we should have a constitution, which is an intriguing concept, but I don't think that should come uh, from the top down. I think if the communities, and I'm saying the plural, really want to work and spend effort and time creating a constitution and thinking what the purpose of it would be, it shouldn't come from the board. And I'll add a little bit to that, which is one thing the foundation does want to do is to clarify things that the foundation is not going to be responsible for. So part of the foundation strategy is going to be things that are not within the foundation's scope. And to the part of the question before the Constitution about whether there needs to be clearer division of authority and role between the foundation and the communities, the answer is certainly yes. And how we get there, whether that involves some kind of ground, groundswell in the Constitution, which would, I think, I think the foundation's involvement in that is as an observer, not even as a uh, participant. Uh, that's, that's a great question to have. This coming year is a nice time to have it because having the change of a new ED and a new focus on technology uh, provides a little bit of momentum for other projects. Okay. I see there's another question on the wiki and I just want to thank the wonderful mobile engineering team for having that great little green bar that lets me know when a new audit has come up. That's great. <laughs> All right, um, before we go to the question on the wiki, are there other questions from the audience? I think we saw some hands earlier down here in front, and then we'll go to you up in the back. Oh. <laughs> we'll go up to the back first, and then we'll come down in front. <laughs> Hi, I'm Delphine from France. Um, I have a question for Anna. Actually, uh, uh, you're going away, and I'd like to know what you're taking with you uh, from your experience within uh, this org organization, and also given your um, experience in other nonprofits, international nonprofits, I'd be really interested if you had some advice for us as we go forward. Unfortunately, I think I'm getting out of this experience of one year much more than I was able to give, and I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I learned a huge amount being just here for a small period, and it's my first week manian, and I wish um, no, I had the opportunity to stay more. I think what I take, um, which is fresh, I've been involved in many big organizations like ActionAid, Greenpeace, Amnesty, and the Wikimedia movement, community, the foundation, you are much fresher. You, as Salil yesterday alluded, you started in a different moment with the internet. And I think that freshness is what I'm bringing out mostly and looking at back of those old organizations that I'm very involved with. Um, that freshness, I think we are lacking in the other world, and you still have. And in terms of what I think uh, the danger is, is that you may be locking yourself into the same things that those big organizations have done. And I think that's a big danger. I mean, the world is there, you now divided in countries, divided in different communities, and sometimes I feel that uh, we are just repeating those mistakes that some of those organizations have done, rather than just clear focus on the causes that we are there together. So we go into politics, internal politics, more than perhaps I wish, but all those organizations have that. Great, so I'm gonna go back to the question on the wiki and then we'll come back to the audience. Uh, the next question is, does Wiki News have a future? The short answer is that's not for us to determine. 
And the long answer I'm more or less comes down to the same thing. If the individuals behind Wikinews can make it happen, and for a large degree they have in some areas booked success, in other areas they haven't. It's, it's like asking, does Wikipedia have a future, except it seems to be more certain for that. But it also still depends on everyone in this room and everyone outside this room. I, I will be a little more specific in that we, have not, we haven't directly talked about Wikinews any time recently. So there's nothing to answer because uh, we have not talked about it as a, as a body. And just to be, I don't think we, we I, the last time we talked about a specific project is a very, very, very long time ago. The board doesn't discuss that kind of thing. That's it does, true. It, the board, it, it does the discuss, board yeah, did it, not like approve Wiki Voyage. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I think the so, general idea is yeah. that, that um, we do approve thematic organizations and chapters, etc. but the projects themselves, when they're not dependent on an organization type which might need to be approved, are not are within our purview. No, uh, and we, I do we, hope we, that they find th creative ways to make certain things succeed and might change the formula or make this work. That's, as I hope that every individual who has an idea for creating content is successful. Yeah. Just a brief and personal comment, not in any capacity of member of this board. I, 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 I think that uh, Wikinews uh, is having some success in original reporting. I think if it has a future, might be is in that direction, but just my humble opinion. Just a a brief personal thought is that uh, uh, the long way for uh, Wikinews, I think, is very hard. And it's quite similar to the, um, to how the citizen journalism is evolving. Probably is not uh, anymore a trend, and that's why uh, Wikinews uh, perhaps is not growing so faster in this moment. But uh, as Yamba told uh, at the very beginning, it's up to you. Hi. So, in my personal opinion, I think uh, I was more optimistic a year ago about the future of Wikinews than I am currently. Um, I think we could have supported more that project, and this is true for other smaller projects. Um, I hope the different communities, uh, and I'm not referring specifically to English Wikinews or Spanish Wikinews, but to all of them, I hope they can find a path forward. Maybe it's focusing on, you know, on original reporting. Maybe it's focusing on some other aspect, and I hope they can move it forward. Uh, they have to understand uh, we don't think they have to compete with other news sources like BBC or CNN. They have to find a path that is sustainable for the size of their communities, and hopefully they will have a very long future ahead. Can I also just hijack it? Actually, what I wanted to do was, Delphine, the question that you were asking Anna, I wanted to answer part of it, but I thought it'd be very rude since it was specifically directed to her. But now that we've had a little gap, I think I can try and answer it. OK, so what I wanted to say was one of the things that really struck me five years ago when I came in as an outsider, and which still strikes me, is I had a history of working with movements and with volunteers. And I had never seen, and I still haven't seen, the kind of volunteer zeal and commitment that I see in the Wikimedia movement anywhere, right? At the same time, I think trying to link this with something that Lila said yesterday in her opening statement, which is, how do we look at, the, at bringing the next billion people online, right? How do we really look at reaching out and sort of ensuring that Wikipedia tomorrow doesn't become what the print industry is becoming today, which is somewhat obsolete or not sort of a primary source. I think one of the things is that we tend to, as a movement, be somewhat inward focused, and we tend to think inside out, but not even like going out, 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 right? And I think one of the things, uh, risks for us is really that we need to complement this inside outish type of thinking with an outside in kind of thinking. We really need to think of people 
who are using Wikipedia, who are sort of, you know, very far removed from the kind of discussions, et cetera, that we are having. And just to explain one like very common thing that happens, try explaining to an outsider how Wikipedia works in like three minutes flat. It's extraordinarily difficult, but frankly, if we want to keep Wikipedia as vibrant and as relevant, et cetera, as it is, I think we need to switch a little bit of our headspace in that direction. Okay, just a little context for, I'm more sure of all of when you follow Wikimedia L daily. Um, I just sent out an email just now, and Bishaka will not be, uh, is not available for her next term, so she's actually referring to the fact that at the end of December she will be leaving us as well. And may I just say, we're going to miss Anna and Bashaka both hugely, immensely. They both brought um, tons of energy and knowledge to this board. And a, a lot of it from both of you is this perspective from the outside world. Um, and uh, and I would agree. I think, it's, I think it's interesting. Some of the things we've talked about this week or this meeting, the last two days, so, Jambart, you said the project is not our decision, and that, that's true, but how we think about global knowledge is, is what the board does. And, um, and we, have, we have been talking. We have been talking about that. Um, how, we, how we think about what's missing, how we think about integrating different types of knowledge, et cetera. That does not equal any particular conversation about a specific project. Phoebe, when you say that uh, Bishaka and I come from outside the world, I feel like uh, somebody from another planet. No, not outside the world. Yes, outside yes. This world. The outside world. Yeah. But also, if I can There's follow up on that, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, okay. great. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they maybe go on the radio. Yeah, no, I explained that. Uh, go on, Bishaka. Yeah, so just to follow up, yeah, I think, but you know what, honestly, like when I came in, I was an outsider. I really felt like I sort of crashed into this crazy world that I had no idea of. And I have to say, I really want to thank everybody for being incredibly like trusting, open, sort of showing me the way, all sorts of things. And I want to say, since Jan Bad did announce that I will step down at the end of this year, it feels terrible to say it because the reason is so trivial when we think of everything we're trying to do together, but the truth is that time is a major factor and this is a very time-consuming commitment. But what I do want to say is that coming from the outside, I now feel like this is as much my world as anybody is here, and so I do intend to remain part of the bigger Wikimedia movement. Yeah. Thank you. We're so glad. <laughs> So I'd like to go back to the audience for a question. I saw that we had one right down here in front before. And please, I see all your hands, and I will definitely get back to you. And if there's anybody up at the top that has a question, if you don't mind waving your hand around a little bit, it's kind of hard to see you from the stage. OK, um, I have a, a few questions. Um, I'll try and keep them as brief as I can. Um, so um, first of all, um, I wanted to say that I, having been a trustee and come back to Wikimedia UK, um, I found that the FTC process, which has obviously been brought in over the last couple of years, um, I think has driven more positive change within the chapter movement um, than any other process that exists or has existed within the movement. Um, and my first question was, um, I think that it's something that could drive similar positive change within the foundation. And obviously um, has partly been involved in, in subjecting itself to the FTC process last year, and I was wondering whether, firstly, um, is there a plan to, for the foundation to fully subject itself to the FTC process in the, in the same way that the chapters do? Um, and then that leads me on to my second question, that obviously we're now reaching a stage where the, the chapters are becoming much more mature and are taking uh, a much more introspective look at themselves. Um, analyzing what their purpose, what their role, and what their value is to the movement, and how they can best deliver that. Um, and so my question is, do you, um, what value do you as, as a board see in the chapters? 
and do you feel that you get enough value from the chapters for the funding that goes to them through the FTC process? Maybe I just took the time. If we are looking so puzzled, it's just there are no monitor boxes or something like that. So it's really hard for us to understand you, although everything you say is quite clear, but it just doesn't come. Un So I, I'll just give a brief answer to the part that I understood. Um, I think that, if, uh, and this is me speaking personally, I think that um, looking into the past, uh, there have been many times when, no, I don't think that the chapters have delivered good value for money, um, given uh, the large amount of money spent um, and the little return. However, part of that is okay, because part of that is doing pilot projects and testing and learning and we try things and we find out they don't work. So you don't expect every new project uh, to, to give perfectly immense returns. And part of that's not okay. Part of that um, is because we as a movement didn't really take measurability seriously, didn't take uh, coming into an idea of what are we trying to accomplish strategically and what's the best way to get there. Um, and so we ended up doing a lot of things that we like doing. Um, and hoping that they did some good. And now I think we have a real opportunity uh, to really focus on those kinds of real bottom line achievements, you know, real questions like um, number of editors, uh, number of good quality editors, diversity of editors. There's a lot of other metrics we can look at, of course. Those are some of my favorite ones. Um, and to be really serious about it. And what I think is really hard is that we have set up this global structure um, where unfortunately every chapter is going to feel compelled, as all organizations do, to come up with a glossy report at the end of the year showing how great they did. Uh, it's a natural tendency for, for all organizations um, when we need to make harder questions and a broader level for the movement to say, wow, you know, this chapter has done a really fantastic job, but they've done a fantastic job in a jurisdiction where we really should be focused maybe on the global south or wow this chapter we love them and they're so great people but honestly what they're doing isn't performing so how do we deal with that and those are hard questions for all of us really hard questions and i think one of the things that's great today is that we're all taking those questions very seriously um, and hopefully we're taking those questions seriously in a non-adversarial way because that in the past has also been really problematic i want to add one thing which is i think is interesting is one of the uh, interesting things is if you hire an executive director with a, a large project engineering background is that metrics tends to come up a lot in, in, in talking <laughs> and getting the right metrics, et cetera. And just like we have to know what every dollar, euro, whatever spent on a chapter brings in with regards to its return on the investment, the same thing goes for the foundation dollar that's spent. And I think that's a really important commitment to make sure that we try and make sure everything we do to the largest degree possible gives insight into the return on that investment. Yep. Thank you, fan club in the back. Um, <laughs> yeah, re regarding the last part that Chambat said, uh, in our first meeting, first day of board meeting with Lila these past days, uh, she said something that was somehow a request from members of the community in the exactly same words, and we were so happy that she tackled in this, this challenge with the same words. She said the foundation should lead by example. So we are supposed to be uh, to get results in the same uh, metrics and uh, as at the other movement organizations. Um, I think you had another question. I'm not sure if I understood well, but you asked whether the foundation is going to participate in the FTC process in the future. Well, uh, the short answer is uh, the framework of the FDC designed 
uh, in a way that this is uh, an attribution of our ED and not of this pod. The long answer is that in the last FTC meeting, uh, we sent the foundation applied to the FTC in a different way than the chapters without a dollar amount. And we carefully listened to the FTC request that was not in this way. Or whether you submit uh, your application in full or you don't and you look for a different kind of community review. Uh, in that sense, my personal opinion is that we have those two options. There's no an option, there's no an option to go to the FTC in a different way than the other chapters. And uh, I have uh, an informed feeling of what are we going to do, but again, this is uh, the call of our ED. I would, I would like to take the opportunity to talk a bit about what it means to be an affiliate or just someone who has a great idea within the movement because I think that is something we need to, to figure out more than we might have done in the past. It is a bit like the WMF is not the center or the, the only place where creativity takes place within the movement, not at all. There are so many really, really wonderful people, individuals and also chapters who use, and, and thematic organization and, and user groups who, who use their potential to brainstorm, to make up their mind, what can we do to spread the word, to, to spread knowledge, to bring our idea into the, the last edges on the world and I do think that what we need to be uh, to do more than we did in the past is to figure out where's the highest potential to make this really happen and where should our support go and also to find out where are patterns that that just uh, reiterate or things also maybe mistakes or just uh, administrative um, over, over, yeah, over cap, which is not needed and figure it out and support and help there on a really, really early stage uh, to get the best out of all those motivated people, the motivation itself and the energy and the creativity. I would like to see more creativity within the whole movement. Uh, there's one of our oldest mottos, and this is funny because I borrowed something from the Italian chapters a few hours ago, but I see Frida wearing a shirt, and one of our earliest mottos is be bold. And I do think that and I can't really make out when that was. But, but we are not yet so sticky on that motto. It faded away a bit, but it, don't, it didn't lose its power. I think being bold should be something we should have in mind with everything we do. And that should be kind of a yeah, rebirth of or, or, or there should be some kind of rebirth of this motto. I would like to see more people wearing this Italian T-shirt. Um, so I'm going to go. <laughs> that yes, I just want to um, applaud that. Actually, uh, I see the value of chapters and user groups and our thematic orgs as being bold trying new things. When you go to the coolest chapter projects presentation, and I hope you do later today or tomorrow, um, the coolest projects that get picked out are the new things that people have tried, and that's important to us. Um, the other thing that we talked about this week as being a particular strength of local groups is building local partnerships, right? Building local partnerships with 
cultural institutions, governments, local places. Um, that is a thing that our local groups are very good at. And I don't, this is not an either or distinction necessarily. Um, I think that people should try things, not feel like they have to do certain types of programs simply because they are a chapter. They should do the things that work for them. And uh, we should focus, as Jimmy said, on what makes sense, what's, what's efficient, what, what gets us bang for our money, what, what works. Um, I lost, I lost my train of thought, but, but I think, I think that, that those are the kinds of things that we've been talking about, about the strengths of local groups and chapters. And, and I am deliberately including user groups because I see lots and lots and lots of promise in user groups. I think almost everyone at this table has been involved in some sort of local group and they're cool, right? Like they do cool things, so. So because we just have 15 minutes left, I'm gonna focus on the audience for now and because we know that the questions on Wiki will certainly be answered going yeah. forward. Uh, so right in the middle there, yes, sir, with your yellow pants and the white shirt. Thanks. Great. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you guys. I'm from Brazil. Uh, my name is Pedro Carrado. My question is for Jimmy. Um, I would like to know your, what's your take on um, this freedom of editing and creation of Wikipedia pages uh, about education, your take on education and education for the future. Um, were you ever concerned with how people are educating them, themselves with what can be sometimes wrong and unverified in the pages? And so, I mean, I understand that people nowadays have, can you hear me? What? I can't hear so, so. Without the mic. No, I'm having a hard time. Yeah, take the yeah. mic out. Can you start? Do it again. Yeah, without okay. the microphone. Okay. Can you stand okay. up okay. and do it without the microphone? It's easier for okay. us to understand you then. Yeah. Try it without the mic. Yes, yeah, try yeah. Without, without the mic. mic. I think the only way we hear is the sound goes that way and bounces back to us, and it's impossible. That was three questions in the first one. So I'll speak to the first one. I think the second one, um, probably the best thing is all of the official communications we've put out so far, I completely agree with. And I think our position is quite well explained there. And I'm in the press all the time talking about this. And I'm also happy to question, answer more specific questions by email. Um, on the first one, the, the culture of education. So one of the things that I know um, about people who participate in Wikipedia is that participating in Wikipedia 
helps people really to become much more serious uh, about their consumption of information because it forces you to look at multiple sources. It forces you to think about what is a reliable source, what counts as good quality information. And so I think that the culture of Wikipedia um, drives us in our community to try to present information that is high quality. Um, and that's part of who we are and it's part of what we're so proud of as a community. And I think that's really important. In terms of the broader internet, um, there is no question that there's loads of misinformation out there. Um, these days, my, my biggest concern is that um, as news consumption has moved from people going to Google News and seeing a lot of headlines and clicking to people going to Facebook and clicking on clickbait headlines and dramatic stories, um, which we're all, I think everyone is probably guilty. They, it's like some kind of, they've, they've figured out how to exploit a bug in the human brain that says, you know, this, the 17 uh, funniest cat pictures you'll see this month, number eight will blow your mind. Oh, I don't want to click. Oh, I clicked anyway. Why am I reading this? Um, I, I'm, I'm actually getting over that now. I hope other people are. But I do have concerns about the quality of information online. Uh, there's also, you know, we've just seen in this the whole monkey selfie story, how many news headlines said, Wikipedia claims that the monkey owns the copyright, which we didn't say, which is a crazy thing to say, and has upset a lot of people who say, you know, well, why would Wikipedia say such a stupid thing? Well, I'll tell you why, because the newspapers just made it up. We didn't say that. And um, our position on it's quite boring, actually. It's a very straightforward law. So um, I hope we are not a part of that. Um, obviously, if there's inf misinformation on the internet, it's going to affect us and we're going to put some of it in Wikipedia. But I think we're the piece of the culture that's saying, hold on, slow down, wait a minute. We really want good, solid information. And so I encourage everybody um, to try to resist clicking on those clickbait headlines and um, let's try to encourage the media to be more serious. I mean, but I was actually just with a, a journalist, um, a very good BBC journalist who said, uh, um, wow, you know, something I, I wrote. Uh, uh, news stories that I've written for BBC News for the tech section, I've seen them quoted um, and cited as a source in Wikipedia, and that makes me feel like I have a responsibility because what I write is going to go in this permanent record. I think, hey, great, that's good for if journalists begin to realize you're not just blasting out some nonsense every day to keep people entertained and amused, but you're actually writing something that's important because it's going to affect the judgment of millions of people over a long period of time, then that's, I mean, that's actually a, a part of the cycle I'd never thought of before. I want to riff on what Jimmy just said, which is not necessarily your question, but I think is related, which is we are part of a knowledge ecosystem. We do not stand alone. We rely on good libraries and archives. We rely on open access. We rely on lots of knowledge being made open. And I think that Wikipedia helps people realize that, and that is a good thing. And we are part of, our movement is not our, just our projects and our people. Um, it's everyone working towards those goals, in my opinion. And um, so to the extent that we partner with open data initiatives and open access initiatives, et cetera, et cetera, um, those things will help as well. I think we have time for just one more question, unfortunately, but of course, you can always add your questions to the wiki. Um, gentleman right there with your hand up in the air. Christian. Yeah, and if you could project, and of course, Bord, if you need anything repeated back. I try with the mic, without the mic. Without, without. without. That's great. Nice That's wrap up. Super. <laughs> All right, should we just go around the table? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's do that. We Can should you repeat. You want to repeat it to me? What's the biggest oh. opportunity? Oh, you make it hard for me. Yeah. Um, 
starting there? Um, I, I think one of the great opportunities for us in the coming year and, and in the coming years is in the languages of the developing world. Um, the number of people getting online in the developing world in, in many places is astonishing. The boom in the internet access that we all experienced in wealthy countries in the late 90s and early 2000s is happening now um, on mobile devices. And that next billion people is coming online faster than anybody realized. And there are people who's, who have enormous problems in accessing information. Um, the, there's little information online in their languages. Um, it's the, the problems compound from there. And that's a huge opportunity. And I think it's going to require a lot of tech investment. Uh, it's going to require a lot of support from the community to welcome those new communities. I mean, there's always people out there who are trying to help uh, small languages grow by going and offering them some tech support and how to edit support in a language that they also understand. To me, that's the most exciting thing. Um, and it's, it's happening now. Okay, plus one to everything that Jimmy said, and just... I just want to say thank you to Bishaka on this same theme. Before Bishaka came on the board, I was somehow the expert on India, because I've been there a few times. Um, and I, I would like to see our board uh, remain and, and grow a little bit in its geographical diversity. I think it's really important. Sorry for stealing your expertise, Jimmy. But, um, so yes, apart from agreeing mobile languages, all of that, I think also new ways of receiving information. I don't know how many people there are here who like to sometimes watch a video instead of reading something or hear something, etc. I think stuff like that is going to grow. I'm one of those people, every time I go see a movie, I whip out my phone in the middle and I quickly check, like, who's the director, who's the whatever, whatever, whatever. So sort of some of that bite-sized information type of stuff as well, yeah. There are so many things I want to talk about um, that I am having a hard time prioritizing, but I will share with you one thing I learned this morning from Lydia Pincher, who manages the projects for Wikidata, um, that 10,000 new people have edited Wikidata who have never edited another Wikimedia project. That's astonishing, that's amazing, and we will hopefully continue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also agree with what my colleagues have said. Uh, I was going to talk also about Wikidata. I know the one of the great opportunities uh, we have in front of us is uh, providing better integration between our different projects. And I remember this session last year, we talked about uh, the fascinating growing of uh, Wikimedia Commons and Wikisource especially. And there, there's now uh, also, along with Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, Wikisource, et cetera, a new star in the sky of the Wikimedia movement world, whatever, which is Wikidata, in fact. And, we, and Wikidata is also pushing us, because the next move, when we have the pure data structure in a single website, uh, is, uh, Wikidata is pushing us to find better ways to integrate all of our projects, because being simple data, it is related to any one of our projects. Uh, and I think that this will help you to find ways of better integrate our different projects and to better present the content of the different projects. Oops. I think that uh, we are uh, deeply linked to the future of the web. Uh, in this moment, there are a lot of people, as someone already told, that uh, are without internet access on a way. And on the other side, there are at least a couple of generations that are not interested in the web. But, but this will probably change in the next few years. Also, the way we are using the web will change. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this will affect uh, our project, too. I'm not sure in which way, but I think that we need to think about Okay, so the project answer is yes, Wikidata. <laughs> um, 
The bigger thing I'm enthusiastic about is that we have an executive director in Lila who has, has sort of has the motto of, I want to see what works and scale it. And I think if we can make that work across the movement, things like we see Wiki Loves Monuments works, we can scale it. And what we learn from that and we make it easier for other people to share the successes and not repeat the mistakes, that's the most exciting thing I'm looking forward to. The problem is that at this point, well, most of the interesting <laughs> things have already been said. Um, Wikidata, yes. <laughs> Mobile. And um, something particularly exciting would be uh, the possibilities in the technological department, all the tech toys we might be getting for the different projects. I really look forward to see what our engineering team can do in that regard. I think the greatest opportunity for us is making it easy for everyone to contribute again. Creating draft spaces for material that's not yet ready for any of the current projects. Creating a draft commons for any media that people want to share that's not yet ready for commons. Making spaces where anyone can share knowledge that they have about whatever they know, where it isn't going to be deleted and removed from the public eye. I think uh, the biggest opportunity is um, the biggest challenge at the same time. And I would uh, summarize with one word is simplicity. Getting simple to, to be able to join the movement, to be able to edit, to be able to access. So simplicity, I think, is the biggest opportunity and the biggest threat. Yeah, when I look outside, outside of my rooms or my houses, I see that the world is changing in a very, very high velocity, so it's quick, it's fast. Something is happening in every second. And people are wearing glasses, with, which gives them uh, additional information. And we talk about augmented reality and everything like that. And our, our core project, the Wikipedia, is, is so slow in adopting these kind of ideas and things. And, where I see opportunities with that background is we are many. There are so many of us here, and there are so many of us not here, but also join this group of people, and we are strong, and we are still able to initiate change. Come to the keynote tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Catherine, thank you so much for moderating this. I would like to thank you all for attending. Um, I do want to uh, add one or two more things. Is We couldn't help but notice that the, the gender questioners were somewhat gender biased, just much like our projects, we, we had an overrepresentation of the male population. Thankfully for everyone, there's two more opportunities. You can talk to each one of us during the whole of Wikimania and ask us questions individually. We're there, that's what we'd like to do. Um, as I said, this is the most exciting and yet also the most uh, tiring week of the whole year, but it's a great week. And secondly, uh, as I've committed to before, if you add your questions to the board Q&A page, uh, we will move them to the board notice board, and I will put a message on the Wikimedia uh, L mailing list, and we will try and answer as much of them as possible, ignoring those that are intended to inflame us. Um, Finally, a, a very light request. Are there people that are playing the usual board Q&A bingo that are missing words? Because <laughs> this usually have this square with like all the cool words we're supposed to say. If no, we're okay. Thank you all Come very much for us. attending. <laughs> and I uh, hope to see you all next year. And if not, in the next couple of days. Um, great, thank you.
I am wearing a white shirt. Not better? Cool.
Testing. One, two, three. Great. No, keep going. Uh, hello, we, I'm just saying something. You can shut your ears, Wikipedians, uh, but I will say it again uh, when you're to wake up. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Marvellous.
Hello and welcome back. We've got three fantastic speakers for you this session. Mike Bracken, Rufus Pollock, and Peter Murray Rust. I'm very excited to hear these. Um, first, I'll introduce Mike Bracken. He was appointed Executive Director of, of Digital for the UK government in July 2011. He is responsible for overseeing and improving the government's digital de delivery of public services. Mike is leading on the work to transform public sector services to a digital by default model by building and championing a digital culture that puts the user first and delivers the best low cost public services possible. Prior to joining the government, Bracken worked at Guardian News and Media as digital development director for nearly four years, co-founded e-democracy site My Society, and was a director shareholder at technical services company Wavex. Today, he's going to talk about software as public service. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Mike Bracken. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation today. Hello, Wikimania. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm going to run through an emergent idea today, software as a public service, um, which is highly appropriate, I think, for, for all Wikipedians and all followers of open data. Um, though I don't think there'll be too much time for questions at the end, but I'm going to try and go really quickly. It's an odd question. I'll try and take that if we have time. So let's get to it. Can I just ask first, um, who has, seen, has anyone here seen me speak before? Unfortunately, had the pleasure. Right, not too many. Okay, the old jokes will work then, smashing. Okay, uh, I'm Mike Bracken. I run the uh, government's digital service. Uh, it's this place. It's full of people like this. And um, at heart, we're a, a team of government, a team in the centre of government, who builds services focused on users. Uh, that's unique, pretty much, around the world. Governments generally don't do this. They don't put teams of people like us at the heart of government. So I really want to talk to you about today why, what we've been doing, but also the ethos behind that. I think it's shared with many of you here today. Um, we have a culture of openness, openness around tools, around data, and around software. And I will come to talk to that, that openness, and how we got here. But first, there's quite a bit of exposition. And let me just give you a little bit of history about how we started. We started in 2011, um, and Martha Lane Fox, the then digital champion, who is an incredible backer and supporter of us, wrote a series of letters to Francis Maud, the Minister of the Cabinet Office, and they came up with a report, which I took part in, called Revolution Not Evolution, Digital by Default. And if you boil the report down, it's quite slim, it's worth reading, you can boil it down to four things. These are the four things you've got to do. Create GDS, create a digital center of government in the... Uh, as I say, in the heart of government. Fix publishing. Make government look like government every time you use it and start talking to people and having a conversation with people rather than broadcasting out with lots of different brands. Then fix transactions. That's how people deal with government. We have a bewildering number of those. And finally, go wholesale, which is take this data out and let's all take part using it and creating new services with it. So that's the strategy. It's disarmingly simple. Doing it is less disarmingly simple. Uh, we do an awful lot of things at GDS, and mercifully for you, I'm not going to talk about any of those today. We do have six main programs. The first is gov.uk. Has anyone used gov.uk? Great. Your favorite website, apart from Wikipedia, obviously. Um, that's a platform for government. The next is identity. We're rolling that out at the moment. So you can use some of your own identities to deal with government. It fundamentally changes the relationship between the state, the individual, and businesses. I also run technology for government. I'm going to try and give people kit, a bit like this, so they can get their job done. More importantly, measurement and analytics, giving people data about services. Our performance platform is the start of that. If you go to gov.uk forward slash performance, you can see that now. Fifth is capability, getting more people into government, both as employees, contractors, working with different types of suppliers, vastly widening our skills base. 
and probably most importantly at the moment, 25 of the most important transactions in government. They include things like registering to vote, motoring services, claims, civil courts, tax, health, wealth, uh, tax and benefits. So we're transforming those uh, at the same time. That's full end-to-end -end transformation of 25 of the biggest services. There are major platforms, uh, sorry, our major projects of work. I want to talk a little bit about them and what transformation looks like. Because when we talk about applying things like open data and open access into government, people generally, I think, have a rosy view of what government looks like. Who here has worked in central government? Well, a few people. And you'll know we have a, a fine collection of Victoriana and neo-Baroque monstrosities in which we have to work. Because government looks a bit like this. It is a long, long way from being sexy for those of you who worked in different buildings and different industries. And actually what we're doing at the moment is taking often a Victorian legacy or certainly a post-war legacy of physical infrastructure and making it digital, making services like these and making the organizations think of themselves as a digital service rather than as a big physical structure. That is a profound culture change and that's why we have to be open. So we don't really focus on the big sort of political intrigue or the big policy of the day. We focus on getting stuff done and particularly transactions because we have a very strong belief that it's services that we should um, concentrate on and it's delivery of services. People's relationships with government is often not political, it's just stuff you wanna get done. Stuff like this, booking a driving test, paying for your tax, all of this stuff. Because every single time people deal with government and this stuff doesn't work or is suboptimal, it costs a lot of money. It costs people money, it costs people time, it costs government an astonishing amount of money and government's money is your money. So we're part of a group that saved that uh, amount of money last year or to put that roughly, that's 1% of GDP. So that's... <laughs> I will take that applause on behalf of the hundreds of people who have been carving that money out for the last year, none of whom get to stand on this stage saying this stuff. So um, there's a big, big picture. So how do we do all this? Now, there's a lot of stuff behind all this, obviously, and there's a theme to today. I want to talk about software as a public service. Um, I'm going to really talk about three approaches and three issues that we've learnt in this journey so far, but I'm more than happy to take questions and talk about anything else. The first approach and the first things that we have learned, and it, it, you can never say it enough, is starting with user needs. This is a little uh, device we have on the windows in our offices. Uh, it's a bit of tracing paper with a bit ripped out, just to remind us if we ever forget about why we go to work, who's paying our wages and who we should be focused on. Um, it's our first design principle, is to focus on user needs. So why do we have to say that? That's, why is a man on stage telling you that the government's focused on user needs? Well, actually, the reason we do that is like many large organizations, we haven't been on focused on users for a very, very long time. We've been focused on ourselves and on policy and on our manner of infighting and our manner of supplier relationships, but we've often forgotten the poor people who have to use these services at the end of the day. And digital transformation gives us an opportunity to address that. Um, we built Gov UK literally from the ground up with those cards by putting around on the floor and on the walls all the needs of government that users had and then grading them and putting them to some sort of hierarchy and structure and going at the big ones first because it plays a part in everything that we do. These are our colleagues in Ministry of Justice who are starting through this now. They've got a great view out of their window, Buckingham Palace with royalty and the rest of them have users. So the first message is user needs. The second thing is a relentless unapologetic focus on delivery. The strategy is and always will be delivery. It is so important to focus on the outcomes and getting stuff done quickly. This is a poster in my office, that's Russell Davis in our office, and the reason that poster went up was I was so sick and tired of people going in, coming in saying, well, I've, I've got all these PowerPoint slides, and I've got this plan, and I'm gonna do a, a procurement, and in a couple of years we'll have this thing. It's like, just show the thing, because it's so easy now to create stuff that users want to see, uh, and it's actually more important to do it 
quickly and iteratively than it is through a giant plan to invent the future because the future comes around so quickly. Well, put it this way, this is a guy called Simon Willison who I had the pleasure of working with briefly um, a few years ago when I was at The Guardian. And, you know, Simon famously said this, you can now build working software in less time than it takes to have the meeting to describe it. I've been to many government meetings. He's not wrong. But the critical thing about this style structure is to recognize there's no reason government can't be and shouldn't be good at technology. Um, our version of what we're doing now, which might seem unusual for a government, is actually rooted in a deep-seated legacy of how government works in this country. This is one of the slides where I say, do you know who this man is? And you say, no. Um, this is one called James Brindley. And he set a precedent in the UK some time ago. If anyone, anyone know Brindley? Social history? What's the word associated with Brindley? Canals, correct. Well, it is the same Brindley, it is canals. And James Brindley famously built canals, which actually were the sort of infrastructure behind the growth of the Industrial Revolution in the Northwest. But what Brindley realized, he was a terrific engineer, and I can't do it justice here, but what he realized is a lot of this stuff was already built. He actually linked them up astonishingly well. He networked what was already there, or you could call it, he joined small pieces loosely joined, and what Brindley did was create a system from the pieces that were already there. We have similar models of large-scale civic infrastructure in the UK. This man is William James Bazalgette, and he was the head of the Metropolitan Board of Works in the 1860s. His job was to fight cholera in this city. What he designed was a sewer system, another amazing piece of civic infrastructure, but he designed vast, vast capacity and it powers this city to this day and has led to the growth of London in the last 150 years, or you could call it a series of tubes. And he built this huge capacity, but a bit like Brinley, but even more so, he realized something about civic infrastructure. It, of course, has got to be useful. That's what infrastructure is for, but it also has to be beautiful. This is a place called Crossness, which is in the southeast of London. It's not annually that way. And it's one of the pumping houses. And when he built this, it's not entirely a folly, but it's not far off. It's a pumping station. There's some pumps for the, for the sewers. And, but people used to go for a day trip and go, oh, look, isn't that on the sewers? Lovely, because you can't go and look at a sewer. Well, you can do, but no one wants to. So you have a day trip. The Prince Regent famously had dinner here. But the point about it is you recognize that civic infrastructure needs to be beautiful. So those messages that you can join up pieces, you can, small pieces loosely joined of stuff that's already there, and you can go for massive capacity that has beauty, underpin what we do now. And to, un to understand that in a digital age, and to follow the patterns already set, that design pattern that Brindley and Bazaljet left us, one needs government employees who can understand technology, but also who can speak to power and deliver services and enable innovation. Because civic infrastructure gets made on the ground, and that's something that this man understood, and it's people, all the people who build Wikipedia understand, is that the infrastructure itself and the data within it is done at the point closest to the user. Because we have a view that democracy, in a wider sense and in a digital sense, isn't undermined by a failure of ideas. Of course, there are democratic ideas all the time in the news, some accessible, some not. But it's this constant drip, drip, drip of inadequate services. That's what democracy looks and feels like to someone who is using a public service. We bake that straight into our thinking. This is lasting powers of attorney, one of the first services we've done. Has anyone used this? Lasting powers of attorney, how was it? When did you use it? This year, last year? Yeah, yeah. This year. Ish. All right. It's better. It's not brilliant yet. But the point was, it used to be absolutely awful to use. And lasting powers of attorney is something you do at a time of life when you're transferring assets. Maybe someone's died or something of that nature. You don't want to be learning a new stuff. It's solicitor backed. It's a lot of paper. We took about 80% of the paper out of it, made it a digital service, and made people's lives just that little bit easier at the time when they needed to deal with the state. Something interesting happened when we created a beautiful or more beautiful service and when we put the user needs first. Our colleagues up in Birmingham and Nottingham with whom we made this said, you've got to come back and add something. And we were like, well, what is it now? And they said, you've got to add this button because people are calling us saying they really like it and that's never happened before. Like we've never had positive feedback. So the point about that button is that is one of the roots of democracy.
It's the strength of democracy therein. Therein lies a tale of millions, hundreds of thousands of people getting a better service from the state, using civic infrastructure that is beautiful and works for them. The third lesson is about this, and this is really the theme of your conference today, which is about making things open, making it better. Again, this is one of our design principles. And the thing that I reflect on in this job and what we're doing in the UK is not just to come here with an advert about what's happening in the UK, is we're doing our flavour of this, but this movement is happening all over the world. This is Anders Ansip, this is, he was until recently the Prime Minister of Estonia, and they've got an entire digital government. When you go to the cabinet table, they, they bring your own device if you're a cabinet minister, and you can have live interaction with voters and people in Estonia talking about policy at the same time. All the services are digital. The reason they did that, by the way, is that when their Russians left, they took all the infrastructure. So Estonia gave their infrastructure design, they had no money, to a bunch of open source engineers who designed one, and lo and behold, they made it beautiful. It's happening in different... Yeah, give them a round of applause. It's a great place to get a chance to go. That's Estonia's version of what we're doing here, and it suits them. It's happening all over the world. This is 18F. This is in the US. They are, I think, taking a little bit of the learning of GDS and starting to create a bunch of people in the middle of the US system, which is obviously full of gridlock at the moment, and start to create these sorts of services there. It's happening in Argentina, in Mexico, all over the world, in Thailand, Taiwan particularly. And what we're seeing is a movement around openness that has got different characters and flavors depending on the country and depending on the political and governmental system. But many of those characteristics are common a recognition that sharing makes stuff stronger. When we launched gov.uk, we did it because we did it in the way that we thought was the right way to do it. We were open, our codes on GitHub, etc., stuff like that. But what happened was the great thing is other countries continue to take it, fork it, use it. You know, this is, uh, this is our alpha up at the top left. And, you know, Honolulu government took it and used it. They actually used some of the content, not quite know why. Um, this is New Zealand government, an early version of their site taking it as well. And that's how it should be, because as governments, we have to be open with each other, and we are all facing the common problems. So opening up government infrastructure and data and services as common pieces of software is and has to be the movement of the next era of digital government. It is software as a public service. It's not necessarily ours or yours or mine. It belongs to all of us because all of us paid for it at the end of the day. So this is why we have stuff on GitHub. These are some of our other assets. This is gov.uk. Um, this is a, well, all our data is open. This is a screenshot, obviously, because I'm presenting today. But if you go to gov.uk forward slash performance right now, and if anybody went to actually the tax this site or transport, they could probably shout out the number of live users transacting with government right now. It's all on there. We should just publish that data and have that data open as part of doing business. It is, after all, our data. Crucially, these platforms, whether they are performance or publishing in terms of GovUK or transactional or identity, are there to be built upon. They're there to pick up one of these dashboards and in one click you can use it too. And I'm delighted every day when I come into work and people, wherever they are in the UK, in our public system or anywhere around the world, start to use our systems and our software. Hello, love. My daughter's just walked in. Hello. So you can find the tools for, for doing all this in the open. Because it's not just a matter about publishing in the open, it's about tooling in the open. It's about moving things and putting them into the open so they can be used and built upon. And increasingly, all the tooling that we have in government is in the open as well. I'm going to leave you with some assets and some of our stuff. These are our design principles. This is the place that we start. We've synthesized all our working principles down to these. And it's a work of art to get them down to such pithy statements. We start there. We put everything in a service design manual. Literally everything is on a browser. I was with a, just before this meeting, I was with one of our newer uh, technology colleagues in government who, when you come to government, it sort of hits you the breadth and depth of the place. And he said, well, you know, what, why do I get going? Where's all the stuff? He didn't actually say, where's the manual? But it wasn't far off. I was like, 
don't worry, it's all on a browser, it's all there. And it's like, was that for me? He's like, no, it's for anyone, anyone who cares to look. It's going to get better, and it's going to get richer and deeper, and it's part of a conversation. The same goes for how we deal with suppliers. This whole parlor game of very large procurement, which lock out most people, that's got to go. What we've got to do is have digital services like the G Cloud, where people can turn up, small companies, one, two, three, four people companies, can turn up and pitch for business and get some business using open standards, and they can compete against the biggest companies in the world. That's how it should be. We should be easy to deal with. We can only do that if the, how you deal with us, the tooling of dealing with government, is wide open. Monitoring activity, seeing what you are doing, but seeing what everybody else is doing, seeing what's working, and then rolling that back into our services. That is crucial. And finally, doing things like this, but a bit more elegantly, our blogging platform. You know, it's not exactly rocket science, but giving everybody in government the ability to talk to people using a platform. And so when we open new digital services and have new digital skills, as we did last week in Newcastle, we should be talking about that. And we should be talking about how the problems and the issues and the successes of how we develop digital government. Because without that conversation, we're doing it in isolation. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of these URLs, a couple of these places to go. That's where all our stuff is. And what underpins everything that we do is an idea that we're moving towards a government that is effectively a government of software. That should not be a contentious thing to say. Most organizations all over the world are doing the same. But we're doing it in a way that that software is open and it is bi-directional as a conversation. Because the ethos of public service that our assets, that our infrastructure is common and is public, we should not lose that on this journey. Our software should be exactly the same, which is why it's open. That's why I salute services like Wikipedia, because they've pioneered the way for us, and it's a model for us to follow, because if anything, we want a conversation. With that, I, and on that note, I will shut up and use the last few minutes of this talk, if at all possible, to take any questions. Thanks very much. Hello. I don't know if you've got any thoughts, but your, your software development seems to run quite smoothly, but how come the NHS software development uh, doesn't work quite as well? How long have you got? <laughs> the question, if you didn't hear it, was um, how our software development seems to run, run quite smoothly. How about the NHS? So. Look, there's lots of things. I think what you really mean was, historically, NHS IT, because the NHS now is three. Health is now th partitioned differently. The NHS IT and the spine thing, yeah. Why was it done? I, I've never seen any of the software. I doubt anybody has in, in most places. That's because it was put into a massive procurement. At the heart of that, we weren't thinking about the users. We were thinking about the buyers and the suppliers and thinking about software as something that you procure. The problem with... The problem with procurement, the problem with when you think about procurement is, it's the word procurement. It means to buy once. And when you buy software once, you're stuck with what you've got. So when we say we develop it, to, I'm glad you say it looks like our development is elegant. It doesn't look like that in our office. But it feels like that because we're constantly changing it. One of the biggest problems with large-scale technology procurement is that they lock in this sort of rigid requirements view at the very point where you know least about what users want. And I think NHS IT was probably the biggest example of that. By the way, I'm not here to sort of berate the government. Every government all over the world has this problem, which is an old world view of technology as something that you can procure. Ask the Obamacare group about healthcare.gov. Ask any government around the world. It's a common set of problems. It's not just our NHS. Hello. How can you clone me for digitally backwards countries like Germany? Um, okay. Uh, how can you clone me for digitally backwards? Well, I'm getting on a bit. Uh, you don't want me, and I just get to do presentations like this. I think the critical thing is to recognize that in places like Germany, there are a lot of people and have been for some time doing interesting and far-sighted things. The city of Munich 12 years ago went open source, something like that. That story is well understood now. We haven't done that over here. They've pioneered in different ways. And I think that, you know, look at the, I have the 
privilege, if you like, of looking at other people's technology, like tax systems. What Germany have done is quite interesting and exciting there. I think, excuse me. Okay. Well, compared to some things I've seen, I, I can only bow to your superior knowledge. I don't know. The point is I have nothing, uh, I think the thing about Germany, I'm not an expert there. All countries face the same problems. And we could talk all day about what the problems are, and there's many solutions. There's one solution, I think. There's one solution. Tom Steinberg, who may have presented here, I don't know, my society, Tom put it per perfectly well. Is The single problem is the person who walks through the door to the politician has got to know what they're talking about. That's the problem. Because until you have people at a senior leadership level who understand technology, and by that I don't mean the coding, but actually understand this stuff, then everything gets abstracted. So by the time it gets to political decision making, people don't actually get a good degree of guidance about what they're trying to do. I strongly think that's what's happened with healthcare.gov. Everybody I've talked to knew that system was broken. I knew that system was broken. I talked to the chief architect. And yet, who walked through the president's door? I don't know. You know, this happens time and again. What we have to do at every level and every government is have, a, have a, um, uh, executives and management and leadership who have an awareness of internet-based technologies. That is the biggest generational play that we, that we um, face. Probably why I'm on this stage now, because I'm just about old enough or young enough, if you like, to be a sort of first wave of the internet generation. There's lots more of those people needed all over the place. One more. Uh, I think I'll do two if quickly. If you can do it really quickly. Hello, and then you, yeah? Um, I don't know because I don't know if anyone heard all of that. I was trying to follow that. I suspect I need to give you a one-to-one -one answer. I don't know. I don't know the cases that you allude to. I'm not that familiar with it. I don't think right now is attempt for me to give you an answer is fair, but I'm more than happy to do that face-to-face. -face. I suspect the answer to that will be our colleagues in MOJ, but more than happy to talk to you about that. Um, and so you were the last one. Go on, quickly. No, and it's not a portal, but apart from that, um, uh, the reason for that is that we've not got a common set of identifiers for identity management across that. That will be an aspiration, but don't hold your breath. We will try and get there. We've got to sort out the supplier end first. It's a fair question, but I'll give you a fair answer. In a couple of years, we should be getting towards that. I know it's a nightmare, but we've got to start with what we've got now. Did you have a question? Our resources, 58 million pounds. We spent, sorry? Uh, for 414, we have some interims this year, it takes over 500, but about I guess 70% of all those are embedded in departments and come, you know, under those. So it's a very, very small team. So to give you an idea of context, when I came, we, this is for the entire IT management, governance, and all digital across government. It seems that governments have massive numbers. The IT budget of one of our larger departments is 1.25 billion. 
And when I came, people said, oh, you're going to want a massive budget. So I was like, no, just give me the budget of two websites, DirectGov and Business Link. And I'm still today not spending as much as we were on two websites. So I'm, I, our, our numbers are wide open. It's a great question. But I'm really happy that we've demonstrated massive savings um, on what we were spending. But we've still got some way to go. We're done. Thanks. Thank you for being here, Mike, and thank you for your excellent questions. Uh, I will stall here for a little bit while we get computers swapped over. Um, and I'll tell you about our next speaker is uh, Rufus Pollock. He is the founder and director of Open Knowledge. He's a former Shuttleworth Foundation Fellow and an associate of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Law at the University of Cambridge. And today, he's going to talk to you about the Open Knowledge Society. Thank still, you very much. St we're still getting set up? That's all right. Yeah, Take your no, time. Uh, Take the time that it only takes. It's kind of a... That's all right. It's a fun changeover. I might get to, ch I, I might get to chat with you a little bit here. I'm, That's great. I'm a well done, guys. <laughs> I'm a uh, comedian and uh, a comic and whatnot, and most of my material is is wildly inappropriate for yeah, this sort it. of situation. I am good. <laughs> so maybe power I'll, uh, is in. Perfect. You all right? Thank yeah. You. Great. Ready? Thank you so all much. Right. Thank you. I feel uh, I feel it's like a pit stop. You know, they're gonna we're gonna get faster and faster. You know, uh, the changeover. Um, we did a bit of a practice run before. Great, everybody. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here um, and to get to talk to you. I'm going to talk about creating an open knowledge society. Uh, I'm just going to start at the very beginning uh, and give you a tiny bit of information about, about myself and the organization. Uh, open knowledge. We're a nonprofit. We're a global network. Uh, we've been working since 2004 to open up information around the world, and in particular to also to see that used and useful to empower citizens, to empower organizations, to empower researchers, to empower entrepreneurs, to answer questions that matter and drive positive change. And we do two particular activities. First of all, we open up information, we bug governments, we support governments, uh, we talk to corporations, we talk to researchers and other kinds of uh, and NGOs to open up essential content and data. Uh, starting all, uh, all around the world. And we also then turn, if you like, work on turning data into knowledge uh, and, and change. And that's uh, obviously a huge thing, one where we only have kind of selective and we work a lot with other organizations, including, in fact, Wikipedia, Wikimania, uh, but many, many others, um, from civil society organizations to governments. Um, and, you know, the, some of the projects from CCAN to Open Spending to School of Data, giving people skills, one of the things we focus on today is as all data is starting to be available, substantial amounts of open data, but are there the skills in civil society, uh, in government, in the media, and others to take advantage of this? So I'm going to start with a story about medicine, about healthcare. Um, and it starts, actually, it starts in 2004 in Shasta County in Northern California. And... Uh, a Catholic priest, in fact, a relatively new Catholic priest, uh, he'd previously been an accountant in Las Vegas, so this was quite a career change. He was now a Catholic priest. Um, and sad to say, actually, but this bad later story of this is that he actually got defrocked for sexting um, when I researched this more recently, but that's a, that's a different part of the story. But at this point, he was a Catholic priest named John Carapi. And he experienced some chest planes. And Shasta County is relatively rural. He actually like, did a lot of fishing up here and then traveled around. He was, quite, he, was, he was quite a successful Catholic priest. He, was, you know, he went out on the road giving big talks and stuff. But he got chest pain. And he was in his 50s. And obviously, you, know, you might worry about heart, uh, you know, heart disease, heart stuff. So he went to his primary care physician who recommended, who referred him to what was at the time called the Reading Medical Center, run by a for-profit healthcare chain called Tenet uh, Healthcare. And he had a cardiogram done, an angiogram, an angiogram and this is, oh my God, they can't, you know, he got called up four hours later after he left the hospital, you know, you have to come in for a double heart bypass right now, you're at serious risk, it's a real issue, right now, we're going to book you in two days from now for a, for a heart bypass. 
Now, this is obviously quite a shocking uh, and stressful piece of news. Um, he went home. I mean, he was at home, but he called up his friend, who was still, by the way, this was his, one of his best friends, was still an accountant in Las Vegas. Um, and his friend um, said to him, well, my partner is actually a senior, a senior nurse at the local hospital. Why don't you just let me give her a call and just check about this, get a second opinion? So he called up his partner, and she told him, uh, you know, the phone got relayed, was that basically it was really unlikely it was this urgent. You know, it wasn't like, you know, it's not, it's not like, you know, you've got a kind of aneurysm or something. You have time. If you've got an issue with your heart, you've got a week or two. It's not like, you know, it's not like you have to have it done tomorrow. Why don't you come down to Las Vegas to my hospital and I get a second opinion? So he set off. He came down to, uh, to went down to Las Vegas, flew down, had a second opinion you're fine. There's nothing wrong with your heart. You're absolutely fine. Good condition for your age. So obviously he was now a bit shocked. You know, was he at death's door or was he actually absolutely fine and this was just a bit of heartburn after lunch? So they got a third opinion. Third opinion, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. So they went... Um, they kind of got a bit upset about this. I mean, he'd been very stressed. It's a very stressful experience thinking that you're seriously ill. It's a really, uh, if you're not aware, I mean, I wasn't aware before I read about this, but it's, you know, very serious, obviously, operation, having a heart bypass. They cut you open. They, they split your rib cage, essentially, um, if they do this. It's a really serious operation. So they went in to see the CEO of this hospital. Uh, this, this is a private hospital, right? It has a CEO in the United States. And they said, this is an issue. This is a real concern. What's going on? And the guy was like, don't worry. Mistakes happen. People can misread angiograms. It does happen. You know, and they asked other doctors, and it's true. You know, it's, not, it's not a perfect science. But they persisted a bit on this, and they kind of got upset, and they kind of started asking around. And there was a bit of a rumor mill in this area, of, uh, in, in, in this town in California, you know, that they were, they were a bit trigger-happy on the heart bypasses. Um, in fact, it was said among some of the, it was a joke among some of the, the you know, GPs in the area that you mustn't get a flat tire in front of Reading Medical Center because you'll end up with a heart bypass. Um, if you go in there, you'll come out with a heart bypass. And they kind of got suspicious and they started talking. And in fact, ultimately, they, they got in touch with someone from the FBI. And the reason for this is the FBI are interested in the United States this hospital will charge the government money. It's a private hospital, but it does Medicaid and Medicare. And if someone is defrauding the government, the government can get involved, the FBI can get involved. Anyway, for various reasons, an investigation started, and it turned out that more than 1,000 people over a period of about a decade had been incorrectly diagnosed with heart problems and given serious treatment, often involving a heart bypass or a serious operation. Some of the people had died after complications. Some of the people had been left um, with serious health problems for life. Some people, for example, their chest. One guy, his chest had never knitted back together properly. His ribs had never reformed, and they constantly moved in his chest, causing serious pain. So more than 1,000 people had been mistreated. And the reason for this, sad to say, was, was felt to be profit. Performing heart bypasses on healthy people is very profitable in the United States. You make hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, medical, in medical health insurance payments when you perform a heart bypass on someone. This was the most profitable hospital in the tenant healthcare chain in the United States for this reason. The doctors who performed, who were, who were in the cardiographic department, were, million, were making million-dollar salaries. They never, sadly, while they had a civil suit, they never went to jail. Now, what was interesting, why has all of this got to do with data? This hospital had two, there is actually a data set in the United States. Um, it's not an open one at present, but it was, there was one starting to be collected in the 90s. It was only in the 90s which had information on the performance of hospitals. And this hospital had two red flags if you'd looked at the database. One is that it had an incredible number of heart operations for the number of people it served. It was doing a lot of these kind of operations for the number of people in the catchment area. The second was that it had incredible performance. It had a really good mortality rate for high operations. Because operating on healthy people is really good for your statistics. Now, taken together, that's really odd, though. If you operate on a lot of people, 
in general, you should either be reverting to the mean or if you're in fact taking at-risk people, often it's the case that people that operate a lot, for example, UCL, uh, U University College Hospital in London is one of the best hospitals in the UK, and yet often its mortality performance for certain operations is very poor because it takes the hardest cases. So often, if you were doing, a, if you were an incredible hospital heart bypass, you'd end up with some of the hardest cases, and you'd actually have a poor mortality record. So together, these two things should have been a red flag. I think this brings me to a point about data and the power of data, which is, and about open data. If someone had been looking, if someone had had these suspicions looking and been able to look at this kind of data set and put those kinds of things together, it would have been able to them to transform what was simply a suspicion a general suspicion into an actual kind of hard hunch that something was wrong. And this point, which is if you know your open, free and open source software, you'll know the first, the first of these citations is famous as, to many eyes, all bugs are shallow. To many eyes, all anomalies are obvious. We have this immense amount of data, but we need people to look at it. And the fact was, often, people, even if the data is available inside government, not the right people are looking at it. To give one other example, if Mike is still here in the audience, I don't know if he is, he'll love, is I was told the other day um, by the, 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 the CTO of the UK government that he'd been able to solve, save £6 million in 15 minutes, which I think is doing even better than Mike is doing, which is pretty impressive, by being able to look at government spending money. The UK now publishes open data on spending. And by able, being able just to look through what departments were spending, he realized that the departments were all buying the same £50,000 report, but there are £50,000 reports, believe it or not, or something like that, that they were buying 15 copies of it. Each department was buying its own. And just being able to see that. Now, government could have looked at that before, but it was only when that data became open data and when the government's CTO didn't have to start a digital project but could just go online, search for two seconds and find something, that you made that saving. And this point, again, the best thing to do with your data will be thought of by someone else. If that data had just sat in the Treasury, would the government CTO have been able to make the saving? Probably not. It needed someone else, somewhere else, to do that. And there's so many of these questions in our everyday lives. Is it safe to cycle? I don't know if you know, last autumn there was a whole scare in the UK that there was a whole bunch of cycling deaths. Was cycling getting more dangerous? Was it the weather? Or was it just statistical chance? Where does our money go when we pay taxes? What happens to it? What does it get spent on? Where? And climate change. You know, from the smallest things of the everyday on my, my, my journey, my commute to work on my bicycle, to big things like climate change, data is essential to be able to address these problems. Now, I'm going to come to the problem, I think, that we um, generally, I think, as a community, the open community, but especially open knowledge, are looking to address, which is there are a lot of parts of getting data from of using information to drive change in the world. And most fundamentally, I'm not learning on this list, is that someone ultimately has to use it. But we, I think, in general, have to focus on particular challenges. We can't, we can't boil the ocean. We have to pick our fights. And for us, I think, to start with is to say, looking at many of these examples, the data is locked up. The data is not available. It's not available to me or you. Um, it was in most, many countries in the world, you sometimes struggle to even get the budget, let alone get it in a form that allows you to look at it, let alone get all of the spending data like you get in the UK. On climate change, up-to-date data on climate change and CO2 is still often kept. You have to pay, by the way, tens of thousands of pounds to the OECD to get one of their key data sets on climate change. So data is locked up and data is hard to get and use. Now, in some sense, we've seen incredible progress over the last decade since we were founded, and particularly in the last five years on the first of these, data being locked up. So I'm not going to go on about it today, actually. I'm going to focus on data is hard to get and use. I'm going to get really specific, because I think this is a very informed audience. I don't want to go on too much about open in general. I'm going to talk about something I call frictionless data. I think part of my point here is that data generally, and in a way we could forget open data for a moment, is too hard to get and use particularly in a distributed community, particularly a community that isn't one corporation, that isn't Google, that isn't the NSA. The NSA is probably the biggest data processor in the world. Uh, but if we're a distributed community, if we're a collaborative community, if we're a community that, a community that goes across individuals, that goes across organizations, there's too much friction. And I'm going to push an analogy very hard with you today. And I hope you'll bear with me. It's a shipping analogy. And I like to think of it as logistics. Who here, who here, I'm going to do a bit of interaction. Who here has gone and bought some food in the last week? Maybe if I really wanted to, I mean, hardcore geeks here, maybe I should ask, who hasn't gone and bought food in the last week? You know, no one shamefully puts their hand up. No one has gone, I mean, you know, actually gone out to a store and bought it. Not, I don't mean consumed it, but gone out. 
Okay. But do you ever think, I mean, occasionally it hits you, and you go into a store today, and you just think how amazing it would be for a medieval peasant. Just the incredible choice. You, you go into a supermarket today, and the incredible choice. And you stand there, just in the fruit section, and you think how far some of this stuff has come. I mean, I'm not trying to weigh whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying it's incredible, the choice in front of us. And the miracle of logistics that goes into that. Stuff has been shipped sometimes halfway around the world, or it's even been just shipped from Scotland or from just outside London. But it's, it's been picked by someone, it's been packed up, it's been put in logistics lorries. And you know one of the things about medieval times that was incredible to me when I read about it, I was reading about it recently, is when famines happen, it often wasn't that there wasn't enough, for example, corn grown in the UK. You could actually have localized famines. You could have an issue where there was enough corn in Manchester, but not enough in London, because the cost of transporting corn was so much from place to place. And so the incredible thing for me, I think, about, about transport is how essential it is in our daily lives. When I go to get those ingredients to make a cake, all of the stuff that's gone from the corn being cut in the field to it being transported to me. Now, I'm, the reason I'm having this analogy is it's about data and information. Ultimately, we want to make a cake or we want to eat dinner. We want to produce a beautiful graph or create some new insight or understand whether hospitals are killing people semi-intentionally for money. And that involves getting information together. It's like I go to the information store. I want to get all of that stuff together, the, the, you know, if you like, and I want to bake my cake. The cake is the end analysis that I make, the insight I have, the visualization I make. And at the moment, and I'm going to push the shipping analogy, uh, specifically about shipping, we're almost in an age where I have to go out into the fields and almost get the core myself. Maybe I don't need to grow it, but maybe I need to cut it. I need to mill it myself to make flour, and then I need to cart the flour back, and I need to have some, go and get the, the eggs from the hens. A lot of the time when you do data project, you're doing all of that. You're not just focusing at the end part of it. So I'm going to really push this shipping analogy for a particular specific point I'm going to make about a particular revolution in shipping. So back in 1955, shipping in particular looked like this. And there was a particular part of this, which was that loading ships. Loading ships was a big deal. Right? It was, in fact, I'll come to it, it's a large part of the cost. And this is what it looked like. People, by hand, would load ships. And it was manual, it was slow, and it was costly. And it was also dangerous. I don't know, who here has seen On the Waterfront? Anyone? Yeah, some people have seen On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. And On the Waterfront is about, well, I guess the politics of Steve Doring in the United States, right? These people, this is a whole union, it was a very powerful union that loaded ships. They were called longshoremen or Steve Doors. And if, if you remember in On the Waterfront, if you've seen it, one of the guys who's protesting against the evil union gets crushed in a ship by people dropping stuff on him. It was a dangerous profession, and it was incredibly inefficient. And in 1957, the first containerized ship was built. And it has revolutionized shipping. There aren't, I mean, whether you think it's good or bad, today, there are, no, there are very few people around. Very few people get injured loading ships. It is automated, it is mechanized. And this is one part of the journey, right? This is one part of the stuff that gets, stuff, that gets food, that gets your laptops, that gets your phone from wherever they get made to you when you go in the store. And containerization has revolutionized that. And data is shipping pre containerization That's my argument. Today, we load, we do all of this kind of loading by hand. I just want to give you an idea of how revolutionary this is in terms of cost in shipping. Just to, when I say how revolutionary, this is what it used to cost to do shipping. Okay? So, in 1956, this was the first containerized ship, and you can see it compared to what was called a break bolt, traditional loaded ship. Okay? It's the second line. The loading cost per ton was $5.86 versus 16 cents for containerized shipping. That's approximately a 50 times improvement in cost. Look at the tons per man hour, right? The year, 90, this is over time, but 1956, this is an average. By 1956, 76, most stuff was containerized around the US. In 1959, you did 6.6 .6 tons of loading by hand per man, per man hour. In 1960, you did 4,234, which is close to being a 6,500 improvement in performance. And hours in port went from 504 to 18. And just to give you a sense of the statistic, in terms of shipping goods around, 
It used to be that the five miles either side of port, which included the off offloading, accounted for over 90% of shipping stuff around, even in 1955. It was the off unloading and offloading with by hand that consumed 90% of the cost of this stuff. And that's what happens. For those of you who, know, who do stuff with data today, that's what it's often like. Before you get your beautiful visualization, you've spent days, if not weeks, collecting data together, cleaning it up, working out what's wrong with it, fixing it up, getting it from one machine to another. And I want to make an argument then for something very specific. And I'm going to say, why was containerization so good? And I'm going to argue there were three things that were great about containerization. Right? Just to be clear about containerization, it was just about putting containers on things. It didn't change the stuff inside. It didn't do anything else. It just put a, a standardized box around the stuff you were shipping. It was simple. A steel box is very simple. It was opaque. You could ship iPhones, you could be shipping bananas, you could be shipping cars. It's all the same to the container, roughly. It all goes inside a container somewhere, and then it gets loaded on the ship. And the third thing I recall, which is a bit odd, is moderated diversity. Okay? Which is that not all containers are the same size, in fact. They may look like it, but there are different versions of containers, and I'll come to this. There is allowance for diversity but it's under control. It's not any kind of container, but there's moderated diversity. And so I'm going to introduce the analogy for data here. This is the, the, the point I'm making called data package. You can find out more at data.okfn.org, Open Knowledge Foundation website. So the data package, I'm arguing, is the analogy for the sh shipping container for data. So I'm not going to go, this is, this, is a, this is a keynote talk, so I'm not going to get into the dirty details of the tech, tech of it. But what I'm saying is it's incredibly simple wrapper around your data. It's like, a, it's like a shipping container. It's pretty bare and simple, and it says there's this data package.json, and you can put data inside this thing. The second thing about it that I'm going to come to, which I'm, uh, that we could talk more about, but it's, it's any kind of data. Data packages ship any kind of data, just like, just like containers can. They're opaque to what goes in them. They can ship geospatial data, they can ship tabular data, they can ship wicked images, they could ship video, they could ship whatever you like. They're focused more on structured data. And the third thing is what I call moderated diversity. So just to go on about this one, for those of you who are your shipping geeks, I don't know if there are any of you here, but I, 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 only, I, had, to, I had to get up to speed for this talk. That's a, the, the container on the left is a real Rolls Royce. It's a very specialized container. It's a pallet wide, exactly one standardized pallet wide. By the way, I didn't know this before, but pallets, if you know what I mean by a pallet, a wooden pallet, they're standardized. There's an ISO standard for pallets about their size. And this is exactly one pallet wide, 45 foot long, high cube shipping container. So it's a shipping container, but one that's slightly specialized. And that's the same with data packages. There are data packages just for tabular data that say, you've just got to ship this kind of thing. It can't be, it's like a pallet. It can't be bananas. It has to be exactly this thing. It has to be CSV data, in fact. It has to be tabular data. It has to be a CSV and so on. So this is moderated diversity. And so I kind of want to say on this, which is say, this is not, I'm coming in some sense with some humility here. I'm not trying to pitch you some incredible vision. But I think that it's like the shipping container that it seems rather humble and simple, but it has revolutionized our ability to do logistics. And right now, part of our issue is around data logistics. Our ability to efficiently get data from A to B, and to cut out some of the huge amount of effort that is going on at the moment, shipping data around between different places. One could see this in some sense with Wikidata, right? Most of the data going into Wikidata already exists somewhere, in some other system. Yet I get the impression, and I rightly, that quite significant amounts of effort are making, being made to transport it across and integrate it in. That effort has to go down if our community is to flourish. If we are being able to ship data around and therefore build a distributed collaborative community that we want to build. So I'm going to conclude. And I want to kind of loop back from this very specific example to the big picture which is that we're becoming this knowledge society. And in this knowledge society, there's always that commonplace that knowledge is power. But that is even more true today. 
and will become more true during the century. And it's not clear, to be honest, what way it goes. Many of us, I think, have a slight inclination to the techno-utopianism, that technology will generally improve things, and digital technology even more so. It's been incredible what it's allowed us to do. But it's not inevitable. There will be, there is immense power and wealth to be held by controlling information. And we're going to have to have a choice, and in fact, I would imagine some degree of significant fights about open versus closed. And I think this vision that we have of the open knowledge society is one that we want to see built around open rather than closed, around collaboration rather than control, and around sharing rather than exploitation. And fundamentally about empowering versus exploiting people. And that is something where we have to think hard, and it's something where we have to architect systems that allow us. So to go back to why I've gone on today about the shipping container, is fundamentally, I think, at this point, we're starting to win. I think there's so far to go, but we're starting to win in terms of open data. But one of the challenges we have today is we have very little infrastructure. A lot of our infrastructure at the moment seems to be pushing for largeness and centralization. Does anyone remember the net, like, 14 years ago, when I, I mean, 20 in the 90s? I think a number of websites, I go to fewer websites today than I used to, by a long way. The web has become centralized at the present in significant ways. Even Wikipedia is an extraordinary example. It is amazing. But when I first went to the web, I would go to many different websites to find something out. Now I maybe just go to one. And that is a dangerous tendency, and it's a point where things like shipping containers actually matter, because the infrastructure determines how we can collaborate. And our power is in our distribute, is in our community, is in the wealth and breadth of it, but we need the infrastructures that allow us to effectively collaborate at scale. And things such as shipping are part of that. That efficiency is fundamental to how we can set up an open information, an open knowledge ecosystem. So we want to make sure that we become an open knowledge society and not a closed one. And I want to leave you with that, that we empower ourselves to answer the questions, to go to the curiosity in us, to ensure that that ability to satisfy our curiosity to, to pursue it remains. Thank you very much. Thank you, and you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to pose questions to Rufus um, and to Peter after in the, in the Q&A area of the foyer. But uh, now I'm going to introduce Peter Murray Rust. He is a chemist working at the University of Cambridge. His research uses cutting edge informatics and software engineering to develop the future of knowledge driven scientific research in chemistry and related subjects. He has recently received a Shuttleworth Fellowship in Machine Readable Scholarship. And here's a fun fact when he votes, goes to vote in an election, he dresses in a bear suit. <laughs> so. Uh, today, he's going to be speaking about content mine and Wikidata, though disappointingly not in his bear suit, sadly. Um, are, you still, are we still setting up? Great, okay. Any, uh, any, any, anything interesting happening today? Anyone in other rooms? I have, I've been in this room the whole time. Anyone see anything uh, exciting? No? <laughs> what did you see? What, what, what did you see? A what? Oh. Cool. Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. Are we ready? Yep. <laughs> okay. Thanks for, for helping me with that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Murray Rust. Well, thank you very much. This is a fantastic day in my life, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, 20 years ago, I wore this T-shirt. Uh, it was the first World Wide Web conference, and Tim Berners-Lee 
talk at that conference changed my life. It blew my mind away as to what we could do uh, in the digital century. Uh, I have only worn it once before, so this is its second time out in 20 years, and that is to honour uh, Wikimania for its tremendous opportunity to change the world. So, uh, I'm going to talk about Content Mine, which is a project which is funded uh, by the Shuttleworth Foundation, which has given me the opportunity uh, to build something completely new and different. Where's my clicker? How do I... Uh, oh, I'll just do this. Okay. Um, so, we are going to use machines to liberate scientific facts on a massive scale. Uh, and we're going to put them in Wikidata. Now, a day ago, I didn't have this vision, so it's because I've been here with yourselves, and I'm going, instead of yourselves, I'm going to say ourselves, because I am part of uh, Wikimedia, uh, and uh, we are going to change the world. So, we are now all scientists. Everybody in this room is a scientist because they have Wikipedia. They are empowered to understand science. Uh, and that is a change uh, from, uh, let us say, even five years ago. Now we have this information prosthetic, which allows all of us to be experts up to a level in any uh, subject uh, that we think. So we are a social machine. We heard about this uh, this morning. And we are going to build this social machine and make science available uh, to the whole world. Everything in my presentation is open data, open source, open standards, open everything. And I want to make it clear that unless everything is completely open, then you cannot build on it. There must not be a single bit of friction. It's like superconductivity. Unless you get down to minus, uh, sorry, to four Kelvin, you suddenly get that loss of resistance, which means that you can do magic. When we get open, we get magic uh, in the information era. And the problem is that so many people coming up with great ideas get bought out by commercial organizations. And we've seen this uh, in this meta-science and science area. Uh, they get bought up by publishers, by um, private companies, and so on. So I give you my promise, I will never sell out uh, to a non-transparent organization. Uh, I believe in Wikipedia. In 2005, I joined it. I didn't have a, um, uh, a username until 2006. 2006, I looked around for uh, the analog of open source in data. So I coined the term open data. Open data did not exist as a term in 2006. That is hard to believe. So I thought, rather than um, just a little bit of uh, hacking around, I will set up a page on Wikipedia for open data. Uh, and that was the way that I was able to flesh out with a number of collaborators what was known about open data at that time. In 2009, Wikipedia came, was still under a lot of attack. It still is as junk. Academics are appalling. Uh, academics are incredibly arrogant, and instead of welcoming Wikipedia as the digital enlightenment, they trashed it as rubbish. Uh, and at a, future, uh, a meeting on the future of the digital library, um, I said that the bit of Wikipedia that I wrote is correct. Now, it's a little bit arrogant because it shouldn't be I, it should be we, uh, but nevertheless, that was the message. It got through in The Guardian, uh, who published it. At least one person was standing up from academia and saying Wikipedia is the future. And I also said that Wikipedia was the digital library of uh, the 21st century, the century of the digital enlightenment. In 2012, uh, I found that uh, the Springer publisher, um, uh, Springer Verlag, had copyrighted lots of my CC BY photos uh, and was selling them at $60 uh, dollars a piece with the label Copyright Springer over them. Uh, so I flipped out, uh, I alerted uh, Wikipedia to this, and they found that 
a, a thousand of their images had also been copyrighted. We have a real problem, uh, and this illustrates the fact that commercial organizations wish to own and resell and control content. And here I am saying uh, now that I believe that for maths, physical, and biological sciences, I trust Wikipedia and that Wikidata is the future of science data. So, I started with chemistry, and here's Wikichemistry. Uh, it's, uh, I describe this as meritocratic, critical, volunteer community. And I was inspired by that. And when I came uh, to chemistry, there was virtually no open source, and it was not revered. Uh, it was rubbish because it was free. In chemistry, if something is free, it's ipso facto rubbish, because unless you pay for it, uh, it isn't any good. And that still holds today. Chemistry is one of the most conservative subjects in science. So I started something called the Blue Obelisk. Uh, we met under the Blue Obelisk in San Diego, uh, and uh, there are a number of us also doing open data and open uh, source, and I thought, if we can all share a common vision and a label, then uh, we will be able to help ourselves. The Blue Obelisk has cost $10 a year uh, to run. Uh, it has no meetings, uh, it has a mantra, open data, open source, open standards. And that, and the mailing list, is the sole thing that keeps it going. And it has over 20 members, it has scientific publications, it has the world's best chemical software. Now, I wish to repay that debt. Is there anyone here who is a wiki chemist? Come on down, because I am going to give you a blue obelisk. And this is an award uh, to Wikichemistry. This is to the whole of Wikichemistry. It's not just a personal award. And here you go. And I expect to see this page changed by the end of my talk, because it's a list of all the award winners. So, in science, we pay half a trillion dollars per year to fund public science. Now, that's a wonderful figure. Um, I don't know it exactly because nobody knows it exactly. So, the numbers up here are guesstimates, but I think they're quite good guesstimates. Um, and um, uh, we pay this huge amount of sum, mainly from governments, but also from charities, um, and it results in one and a half million publications. That's also a guess. If you divide, each bit, each published piece of work costs $300,000 to fund. Um, and um, that, seem, that sounds a hell of a lot, but actually I think it's about right. Now, if you want to tell the world about this, you don't just stick it up on your web page. What you do is you send it off to a publisher who holds it there for a period, often uh, as much as six months, uh, and then takes money either off you or off university libraries, or in many cases off both, to publish it. Uh, and this is a business model which is incredibly uh, valuable for those people who run it, because they make $10 billion a year or more, uh, which is paid for mainly out of the public purse, uh, mainly through academic libraries. And academic libraries, uh, their main purpose now in science is simply to rent, not buy, rent electronic uh, content from publishers. So, in my view, this is a dystopia. And it's, uh, it's shown by the fact that 99.9% .9 of uh, the people in the world do not have access to this uh, on anything other than an extortionate basis. How many people here do not have daily access to a university library? Right, the majority. You are what I call the scholarly poor, and it is you uh, that I'm uh, particularly sympathetic to. Technically, it costs $7 to publish a paper. There is a free preprint server called Archive, which does physics. Uh, it runs extremely effectively, and uh, they cost 
as I say, $7, and they get uh, hundreds of thousands of papers a year. But because it doesn't give scientists uh, the glory that they require, it doesn't give universities the glory they require, uh, it is not regarded as proper science. You only get uh, glory if you publish in one of these glamour magazines uh, which charges huge amounts and rejects nearly all the science that is submitted to it. Now, science is enormously valuable for us, uh, and the US government paid the Battelle Corporation four billion, uh, sorry, they paid them uh, to uh, do a survey on how valuable the Human Genome Project was. It cost four billion, uh, and some years later, it had yielded 800 billion dollars uh, of downstream wealth and four million job years. So there is no question that science properly done is a wonderful public good. However, that is the exception. And now I'm going to be gloomy for about five slides. It gets better. Firstly, most of that science is wasted. The Lancet said that 85% of research funds were wasted, flawed design, non-publication, and poor reporting. Many scientists only publish 20% of the work that they do. I have this measure in my own department in Cambridge. Our crystallographer says that uh, only 20% of the crystal structures that we do in the department are, are published, even though they are all fit for publication. Uh, and we have a later one with PLOS Medicine here. The publication process, you might think, enhances the value of what goes through it. In many cases, it actually makes it much worse so that the publisher, uh, the publisher receives a manuscript which can be readily transformed into a semantic object, LaTeX or Word, and then they turn it into PDF. Now, PDF is about the worst possible medium in the digital world for conveying information. I spent two years beating my head on PDF. Uh, it has no words in. It has no paragraphs. It has no subscripts. It simply has characters. Uh, we're going to, sorry, uh, we're going to come to this, uh, where's my, I'll try and do it so it doesn't, that's, pa that's a paper. We're going to see it later. It took me several months to be able to read that in PDF and make sure that all the bits uh, were correct, the um, italics, the different font sizes, the subscripts, and so on. PDFs do not have tables in. They do not have columns. This table at the bottom here is unreadable by almost all PDF readers. And uh, when publishers get uh, SVGs, which, as you know, is semantic graphics, uh, they turn it into JPEGs because it's easier to process and doesn't get corrupted on their awful websites. Now, uh, we have PLOS coming after us, so they have a chance of reply. And PLOS is uh, one of the better publishers. Uh, its morals are fine. Its technical quality still destroys science. It's worse. Here's the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, so I'm not making this up. I uh, asked by Michelle Brook um, uh, three months ago about Elsevier and the huge amounts of money we pay Elsevier as universities. And at the bottom, you can see Elsevier is looking at ways in which it can control open data as a private company rather than the public bodies concerned. And Elsevier has set up a research institute uh, in University College London. We are in a race against this. We here in this room have the opportunity uh, to create open data before it gets closed down. So that is my request to us. Let us get moving. The publishers have said we cannot mine their data. We cannot use machines. Now I'm going to show you in a minute how we use machines. We cannot use those machines to extract this uh, because, and they give spurious reasons like, there's no demand for it, and if we do it, it'll burn our servers out, which are not quite compatible. Uh, and uh, it's now got to a stage where the STM publishers, which is an association, is actually now essentially uh, fighting the um, 
uh, you know, the forces for liberation, such as the British Library, uh, the RCUK, JISC, and uh, even myself and Ross Mance. Ross, stand up and take a bow, uh, because Ross, as a graduate student, went to Brussels and fought uh, these publishers, uh, and his case triumphed. And this is a tragic side. This is what you will see if you go out and look for Ebola on the web. Ebola is destroying the people in West Africa. And if you want to read about it, it will cost you $31. Uh, and that should be a public paper. And that is an outrage. Uh, the Lancet is an Elsevier journal, but the same is true Springer, Wiley Nature, uh, and the others. OK, switch off the gloom, because it's going to get better. So, Here's open access. Open access uh, is not yet working uh, in, uh, uh, in academia, but the vision of the Budapest Open Access Initiative is incredible. I want you to take this language on board because it's wonderful, and I actually think it applies brilliantly uh, to Wikipedia and Wikimedia and Wikidata and so on. Completely free and unrestricted access scholars, teachers, and other curious minds. That's a wonderful phrase. And at the bottom, sharing the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, because this does not happen in science, and it is a major drawback uh, to what we have at the moment. So, how are we going to tackle this? Well, the, uh, I, as I say, have been fortunate uh, to be funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation, and we are building a system which is going to liberate 100 million facts a year from the scientific literature. And we assert that if you have the right to read a document, you have the right to mine it and to publish the facts. And the British government uh, has uh, taken on board the Hargreaves report, and from June the 1st this year, we are now in the UK allowed to do this. We can use machines to read the literature and export the facts, and nothing that the publishers can do, uh, 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 there is no legal instrument they can use to stop us doing it. So we're going to do it, and we want uh, us to join us. So. <laughs> science is growing so fast uh, that we cannot read it all. Every scientist you talk to says, I cannot keep up with the literature. So the, uh, Tim O'Hane from Macmillan says, well, the way to do this is to label most science as unimportant and just have some really top-class journals. Could that be nature, right? Okay. Uh, my uh, approach, the content minds approach, is that we use machines to help us understand the literature. And I'm going to show you that with machines, all of us here, as symbiotes between humans and machines, uh, can do that. I use the word amanuensis, which is a rather nice word, as a scholarly assistant. And here in the bottom uh, is Eric Fenby, the um, uh, amanuensis of Frederick Delius. So, it consists of the following, crawling the scientific literature. There is an absolute imperative. We need an open bibliography of the whole scientific literature. That is not a difficult thing to conceive of, and it's not a very difficult thing to do technically. It just seems politically uh, absurd that we haven't done it. We then take each article and scrape it, which means pulling the different components out, the HTML, the PDFs, the pings, the CSVs, uh, and all the rest. Um, we then extract the facts, uh, and we've built specialist extractors to do this. Uh, we index it, and we use Wikipedia as the indexer. Every possible um, uh, entity in there, we would index with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the primary tool for indexing science. And then we will republish it into Wikidata. And this is not vaporware. This is running now in pre-alpha form. Right. So, Here's a paper. We gave that paper to non-scientists to mark up, um, and they were able to pull out all the different terms in it, uh, the um, species, the um, dates, the places, without any training. Now, a paper like Panthro Leo looks very uh, 
intimidating, and most of you probably wouldn't read a paper like that, but it actually is about lions uh, evolving in Africa over the last few hundred thousand years, uh, and uh, whether their different subspecies uh, you know, can be understood to stop them uh, dying out. The other one, again, looks pretty forbidding, but it's actually about making soy sauce. So this is actually accessible to all of you. And this is an example of um, non-scientists. We've tried this out on uh, many people in our workshops, and they've gone through, and you can see how they've marked up different things uh, with different um, colors. And that's what we're going to ask the machine to do. So here's a machine. Uh, this is how a machine might see a bit of science. You don't need to understand this, but you can see the different things uh, that a machine might be able uh, to pick up. If uh, we're doing this really uh, properly, we actually have to understand the language at um, a semantic level. Uh, this is called shallow parsing, uh, and we've written a shallow parser for chemistry, and you can see this um, sentence up here, DMAP was dissolved in that. Now, most of you probably don't understand it, uh, and I probably am a person in this room who knows what DMAP is, but the machine knows what DMAP is, it knows what THF is, and it is able to build a complete semantic parse of that, and that semantic parse can then be turned uh, into RDF and put into a triple store. And the great thing about this is this is a fact. It is uncopyrightable. Here's a typical chemical synthesis. You don't need to look at it other than to realize it's pretty boring. Uh, but the machine uh, doesn't get bored. And that's what the machine does. It marks up every bit of that sentence. And it understands uh, that 3 bromo benzophenone is that thing on the left because we've written a, 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 a tool called Opsin, which translates from chemical names to chemical structures. And we've recently written software which can even read those structures as pixel diagrams. And we did 500,000 reactions in patents uh, in four days on a desktop. So, you know, it is here. So this is our software uh, pipeline for content mine. We start with the scientific literature, we crawl it, we scrape it, uh, we extract it, and then we're going to take the results and put it in Wikidata. And uh, what we need uh, is we need more uh, science plugins. So I've written a chemistry one, I've written a phylogenetic tree one. We need people to do maps, we need people to do um, birds, we need people to do stars. That sort of thing. It's not conceptually difficult, um, and we need the volunteers to help make that work. So we provide a platform on which it's easy uh, to put in plugins. Now, just to show you a little bit of the magic, um, I'm quoted wrongly as saying that although uh, we can't turn a hamburger into a cow and we can't turn PDF into XML. Now, we can now turn PDF into XML. It's taken me two years. Uh, you've got this paper at the bottom left there. Oh, God. Uh, this thing is trigger happy. Uh, you've got that paper there, and that's almost impenetrable, but you can see it's got a graph. And we can turn that graph in less than a second into a CSV file. Um, and this is how we do it. We look at each part of the graph, and the graph consists of axes with tick marks, scales, quantities, units, a label for the diagram, and the points itself. There are probably 10 million graphs out there that look like this. They've all got scales. They've all got units. They've all got, well, they should have. Uh, they've all got titles and so on. So having done this for astrophysics, we've sold it for stock prices. You know, this uh, software is transferable. And when you've got that, you can do clever things. So there's that um, uh, emission from a galaxy. We can look at either the, um, uh, the general decay over the time, or we can look at the variations by using a smoothing or uh, the second derivative. Here's a phylogenetic tree. Now, you probably know that bacterial resistance is a major problem at the moment. So wouldn't it be nice to know 
uh, five minutes, yes, wouldn't it be nice to have a complete tree, uh, a, a evolutionary tree of all bacteria? Now, there's a journal which publishes this uh, bit by bit. So every new species, Sporocelibacterium faurensis, uh, is a new species. So it gets published, and this is the evolutionary tree. I don't use it, but if you go from the left to the right, that is evolutionary time, uh, at least conceptually. So this is how the thing speciates as you go from a presumed common ancestor. And Ross uh, is the person who really understands this. We're going to take 4,000 of these trees uh, and turn them into one giant bacterial super tree. And this is wonderful stuff uh, because um, uh, this is very high quality information. The stuff is marked up in GenBank, uh, which is an NIH resource. Uh, and so we can verify by machine, not by humans, we can verify by machine that this is all 100% correct. And that's the point. We have no human involvement in this whatsoever. Uh, and we can uh, get over 95% of these trees at one a second. And uh, this shows um, another tree. This is for HIV epitopes. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that all of the algorithms that I've coded up for image processing were on Wikipedia. Thinning, uh, Douglas Poikert uh, segmentation, Zhang Swen's thinning, um, backgrounding, thresholding, um, uh, Newick trees, all of these were on Wikipedia. It is a complete uh, repository of all the knowledge I needed uh, to build a software with. This is 30 seconds out. To do science properly, we should record it as it is done. We should put it out on the web as the measurements are taken. And that is what we should, for example, be doing with the Ebola virus. We should be doing our science and putting it out for the world, literally on the day that the science is done. And this is to honor Jean-Claude Bradley, who uh, pioneered this approach um, and uh, who sadly died very recently, and we had a memorial service for him. So this is just to uh, re uh, reiterate here. Uh, we're going to take the literature. We need plugins and volunteers from ourselves uh, to help in this. And I'll finish with my wiki. I'm going to say I put thanks here to people, uh, but I come back to this one. Uh, an open bibliography of science an interface for content mine to feed new facts into Wikidata, domain-specific enthusiasts, and finally, I think that Wikipedia should become a primary publisher of science in the century of the digital enlightenment. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm now going to send uh, Peter and Rufus out to the foyer to the question and answer point next to the press room. So if you'd like to interrogate them, please head over that way. And uh, we'll be back after the break with Elizabeth Marinkala for her keynote address. See you then. Thank you.
And we're back. Hello. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you another keynote speaker here for Wikimania. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Marinkula. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Public Library of Science. Elizabeth served as President of the Society for Science and the Public and published the magazine Science News from 2005 to 2013. She was the Executive Director of the American Society for Cell Biology from 1991 to 2005, and she also authors a column on science education for the Huffington Post. She is the only non-scientist to be named the Faye Golden Cass Lecturer at Harvard Medical School. And she's going to speak to you about the ongoing evolution in scientific communication. Please welcome Elizabeth Marinkula. How would you feel if you worked for years on a novel, an album, or a scientific research article, you poured your heart into it, only to be told that you cannot share the published result because the publisher owns the copyright? How would you feel if the results of a clinical trial for a medicine that could help somebody that you love were not accessible to you because you can't afford the download uh, from the internet? I've been dedicated to the advancement of open access to scientific knowledge most of my professional life. I can testify that the tension among a scientist's desire to put her results in the public domain, the publisher's need to maintain a sustainable business model, and the public's desire and right to access knowledge is not a new thing. But I can also tell you, as a card-carrying capitalist, even an MBA, that it falls to us, the true believers, that confront obstacles to a sustainable model of open access, that this uh, is embraced enthusiastically, not, ju not just by the converted, but by those in the real world. Our job is to convince them. And the collision of interests and the discussion surrounding them is no longer a topic limited to professional scientists and publishers. In the age of citizen science, where anyone with a smartphone can collaborate and participate in studies ranging from protein modeling to species population dynamics anywhere in the world, the discussion involves everyone. On this point, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Each and every one of us in the Wikimania community uh, connects people to information. That engagement, in turn, creates community and builds knowledge. In today's world, there is no reason to limit access to knowledge and every reason to free it. As organizations, PLOS and Wikimedia share a common belief in the self-propagating power of collective knowledge. Both have grown out of communities that recognize the exponential possibilities that internet connectivity provides and see the imperative to exploit the potential for no less than the advantage of humankind. But the basic shared human instinct to do good only works to our advantage as far as it goes. We must simultaneously recognize both who our real end users are and understand how to attract them to participate. Because it's not just the authors whom we ultimately need to convince. At the end of the day, authors will rationally do what they must do to earn appointment, promotion, grants, awards, status, etc. Just as important, we must understand and accommodate the needs and preferences of the people and institutions who are making value judgments about the scientists to determine those same grants, promotion, tenure, etc. Only in this way can we transform good intentions into something larger and more impactful. By increasing access, usability, and uh, discovery of information while maintaining integrity and ensuring appropriate credit and sustainability, we push the boundaries of digital technology to greater collective knowledge. It is, after all, collective knowledge that pushes innovation and transformation. Nowhere has this transformation been more rapid than in the area of digital communication, as you know. 
The vision of PLOS is to fully realize the benefits of digital technology to transform scientific communication. This transformation will encourage collaboration and accelerate scientific discovery for the benefit of all, regardless of geography or socioeconomic status. In order for the benefit uh, to reach truly everyone, scientific discovery must be free and open. This may sound obvious to us in this community, but in fact, only 12% of publicly funded research in uh, science, technology, and medicine is available in this way. The rest is uh, behind some form of access barrier. In our world, that usually means a subscription barrier. As an OA publisher, PLOS provides rapid access to original scientific research without those barriers. And not just the research itself, but also real-time access to the data that underlies the research, as well as the dialogue surrounding the research through social media and, and press coverage. Articles published in PLOS are supported by peer-reviewed evidence provided in both the research article itself and referenced work within the article. All articles are peer-reviewed before publication and monitored post-publication for impact and influence on the community through article-level metrics. As an information and knowledge aggregator with a global force of engaged citizens, Wikipedia curates existing information from OA organizations such as PLOS to create new content and knowledge. Where Wikipedia says citation required, PLOS is a key contributor of such citations. The science community in which PLOS operates as a publisher and the open source community in which Wikipedia operates as an aggregator are two distinct but complementary parts of an enormous endeavor to make available the vast sum of knowledge uh, of infinite communities of people. In this way, both organizations are pushing digital technologies to distribute knowledge, accelerate discovery, and improve the world. The challenges that remain for PLOS are to get scientifically accurate information out to the public as rapidly as possible in a form that's accessible, usable, actionable, and indeed indispensable. However, Access without subscription or embargo barrier is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Technology and enlightened publishing policy must also drive mineability and reusability of data across media. Uh, Daniel Meachin, who's here this week, an active Wikipedian and his group, created the Open Access Media Importer, an automatic tool that crawls scholarly publication databases, uh, including PubMed Central, for supplementary audio and video materials. They upload this content to Wikimedia Commons if they are available under appropriate reuse licenses. This brings rich, peer-reviewed content into Wikipedia, not just from PLOS, but from all OA sources. Conversely, Wikipedia is the eighth largest source of traffic through Crossref's digital object identifier lookup service, covering 65 million journal articles. This reveals how often research articles are referenced in and accessed from Wikipedia pages. Both the Open Access Media Importer and the Crossref Lookup Service are powerful tools that help users find the information they need. Wikipedia offers researchers dynamic content creation and management tools that enable closer collaboration during the research process. These tools are fostering increased motivation for academics to contribute their scholarly, scholarly research to Wikipedia. PLOS is developing new initiatives and models to engage the community in the continuous assessment of published scientific research, which has both great potential to further speed access to research and critically to improve the quality of peer review by transitioning from few reviewers to many. PLOS has a golden opportunity to leverage the work done by Wikipedia in this area in order to advance technology to drive this change. Of course, innovative tools are only part of this picture. Their success depends on community and collaboration. For example, 
The PLOS Wikipedia Pages project leverages the capability of Wikipedia to expand the reach of research articles and redefine what's published. Authors come to PLOS Computational Biology with content suggestions and together with the PLOS editors produce a trustworthy peer-reviewed article for the journal through an open review process that is also posted to Wikipedia for community updating. There is a mutual benefit to new content. Wikipedia is made more robust through the incorporation of peer-reviewed articles, and PLOS authors benefit from the increased reach of their work. PLOS also must consider the path that people take from a web search through Wikipedia into the research literature. PLOS and Wikipedia can work together to help users find scholarly material from Wikipedia entries and to ensure proper citation and linking. Making platforms and systems interoperable will help. This understanding will drive continuous pathways that different communities, researchers, educators, students, funders, policymakers, need to find what matters to them. To achieve this, open content and open data are critical. PLOS collaborates with Dryad, Figshare, and Crossref to move toward the interoperable systems to store content and make it more accessible, more discoverable, and to ensure fair attribution. PLOS was one of the early OA scientific publishers to take big risks to provide a pathway to unencumbered information flow. We remain determined to rise to our responsibility to innovate and experiment in these areas to ensure not only access, but usability, mineability, transparency, and discovery of open content, and how it leads to collaborations that are good for science and good for the public. The OA principle of immediate and free availability is, gen is a generally recognized value. In contrast, the principle of reuse without restriction is generally not readily obvious to most users. Both of these values are already integral to the wiki community, uh, and they're part of the wiki norms of sharing knowledge. Because of the still modest uptake of OA publishing by the science and medicine communities, PLOS continues to emphasize these values to our community. And the free flow of information is especially critical in biomedicine, where immediate access to research can mean literally the difference between life and death. Just this spring, the UK Public Health Minister undertook an independent review of standardized packaging of tobacco and cited a PLOS medicine paper that systematically dismantled the tobacco industry's misrepresentation of scientific data. Inclusion of this freely available article in the review contributed to the conclusion that if standardized packaging were introduced, it would very likely have a positive long-term impact on human health. In this case, time from article publication to inclusion in the independent review uh, to announcement by the public health minister of new packaging regulations was only 10 days. This speed would never have been possible without the open access imperative of PLOS Medicine. Another example that I touched on uh, in the panel this morning in April, the Guinea Minister of Health announced a total of 221 suspected and confirmed cases of Ebola, including, at that time, 146 deaths. Those numbers have since climbed to about 1,200 recorded uh, cases and nearly 700 deaths. On May 2nd, within five days of receiving a submission on this topic, PLOS Currents published a full peer-reviewed article that offered evidence-based information challenging other published findings that suggested the outbreak in Guinea was caused by a divergent strain of Ebola. This critical information provided evidence that Guinea was likely under siege by the same strain of Ebola that had previously caused outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Republic of the Congo, uh, and Gabon, a conclusion that has since been validated. The speed and availability of this data directly impact the urgent clinical management of this fatal disease in real time.
This is a particularly dramatic example, but there are many cases where immediate access to and usability of new scientific information has an impact on human lives. One of my favorite examples of the power of reuse without restriction is the Open Source Malaria Consortium. This is a collective of scientists who harness the network effect in a collaborative, a collaborative approach to cure malaria. One focus of the collective is open source drug discovery using molecules originally discovered by GSK, now available in the public domain. Researchers of various stages of their careers participate in this open forum where all data and ideas are shared and there are no patent barriers. Through crowdsourcing, the Open Source Malaria Consortium has developed more than 100 new compounds for use by clinical and research communities, something made possible only when scientists grant reuse rights to their discoveries. The very creation of PLOS more than 10 years ago by visionaries who saw the value and the necessity of open access publishing was foundational to starting to realize the potential of scientific publishing uh, as well as the business case for sustainability. PLOS demonstrated the important proof of principle that journals can exist as viable businesses in the open access environment if they provide an innovative and efficient platform and publishing experience for authors and readers. Growth in open access continues as more individuals and society as a whole benefit from the unrestricted exchange of information, and as more publishers join PLOS in demonstrating that OA publishing can be self-sustaining as a business. In fact, between 2008 and 2013, there was a 183% increase in the number of open access journals. PLOS expects that there will be continued growth of open access adoption in response to the convergence of distinct pressures from funders, governments, institutions, as they dial up their open access mandates, and from researchers who increasingly demand open access to others' research and that their own research be available to others without barriers. We are in a completely different world, obviously, than when print publishing of scientific research was standard and introduced 300 years ago. Access and usability together with innovation and technology foster online communication, broad dissemination of knowledge, and continuous assessment and improvement to work. Beyond access and usability, publishing technology eliminates many artificial constraints on the communication of science. There are no arbitrary limits on the number of pages or images or the length of an article because there's no postage or paper or mailing costs. PLOS intends to continue to push these anachronistic barriers to expand the definition of what is published, to break free of the PDF and the constraints of the current journal-based approach to publishing. One readily sees the benefits of this expansion when applied to data. To best foster scientific progress, the underlying data from an article must be made freely available for researchers to use, except in the very narrow exceptions when uh, it's neither legal nor ethical. Again, as mentioned in the panel this morning, uh, this year PLOS strengthened its data policy to ensure that every author is obliged to provide her data for a paper upon uh, submission for consideration uh, for publication in PLOS. Full availability to quality data allows validation, replication, reinterpretation, new analyses, and inclusion in meta-analyses, and extends the value of research investment. For these reasons, ensuring access to underlying data must be an intrinsic part of the scientific publishing process. Moreover, the continued facilitation, creation, and communication of new types of publishable objects will stimulate the imagination of authors and software developers. Wikipedia has been successful in part because of the massive scale of its contributions and contributors. PLOS hopes to take from Wikipedia's example by developing its own large-scale engaged communities. To further advance this goal, PLOS recently launched an initiative to engage specific scientific communities in neuroscience <clears throat> and synthetic biology and researcher-led 
informal discussions of published articles and timely issues affecting scientists. Example include data sharing, research ethics, and funding. This occurs through channels uh, functioning as online communities. These channels offer community-generated content tailored to serve the needs of researchers in these disciplines. Working with community edit editors external to PLOS, these sites publish posts from community contributors on issues and trends in their field. They also showcase significant research articles along with PLOS article level metrics to showcase both the academic and social impact of articles. ALMs are a step toward addressing the significant weaknesses in publishing. But peer review itself, long considered the sacred coin of the realm, is badly in need of reinvention and improvement to fully exploit <laughs> the new norms provided by digital communication and connectivity. Traditional peer review, largely unchanged in hundreds of years, starts now when authors submit an article to a publisher like PLOS, it gets assigned to an academic editor, and it undergoes a review process. If everything is copacetic, it gets published. But this takes far too long, typically months, occasionally many, many months. So PLOS is also actively developing rapid release of work, both for expert review and to the public. We are also developing new approaches and tools for continuous assessment of that work. We're moving away uh, from a model of static, one-time review of manuscripts to a model of continuous expert assessment that reflects the latest findings and the evolution of ideas over time. Of course, any new methods to evaluate scientific results need to track with the requirements of the researchers who depend upon those results, the legislators and educators who translate those results into policy, institutions that evaluate work for some aspect of career advancement, the ed educators who use those materials in their teaching, clinicians and patients whose healthcare judgment judgments depend upon these findings, and the public who ultimately funds the majority of this research through taxes. The weaknesses in the current system are not trivial. In fact, they are systematically harmful. As I mentioned, the most obvious weakness in the system today is delay. As I said, months, sometimes years, elapse between the moment when authors are ready to make their work available and the time at which it is publicly shared, creating ever-accumulating delays in the progress of research and the realization of the fruits of that research by the public. The opportunity uh, cost of these delays is unacceptable and unnecessary. Faster dissemination of reproducible results is one goal of continuous assessment. Second, traditional peer review has only a few gatekeepers with a robust assessment system that leverages digital technology, there can be many expert reviewers. By using new research assessment tools, the whole community can participate to refine knowledge indefinitely. Finally, in the current peer review system, the validity and importance of a scientific result are determined at only one point in time before the rest of the scientific community or the public have a chance to see the result. With continuous assessment, the true influence of a piece of work on an entire community is transparent. In short, peer review needs to be timely, continuous, and inclusive. PLOS is committed to this transition. One new approach being developed by PLOS is called open evaluation. This is the broad notion that members of the science community can evaluate one another's work by providing open, structured feedback on published articles, which enables better discovery and measurement of article impact than is allowed by the current practices of publishing systems and journals. PLOS has built a prototype system for open evaluation. We're now working with selected scientific communities to make these pilots available for beta testing. 
I hasten to acknowledge that PLOS is not the first scientific publisher to realize the need for continuous evaluation. F1000 Research right here in the UK is also taking this path. As we experiment in partnership with the community, we must develop incentives for researchers to engage in ongoing evaluation, in commentary, and in assessment of a published work. Here, PLOS, F1000 Research, and all of us can learn from the Wiki community, a community, a community consistently engaged in continuous evaluation and review of Wikipedia pages on a massive scale. A future exists where research is published without unnecessary delays and review is provided by an engaged community through a robust system of transparent, continuous assessment. A future exists where we expand the definition of what is published. Scientific output will eventually reflect the life cycle of research and include all relevant and substantive underlying information and data, which must be easily accessible and immediately available for reuse. The future is one where the only limits on the scientific imagination are those of our minds. Moving science in these new directions will not be easy. It will involve recognizing who our audiences are and correspondingly adopting changes in culture, alterations to academic, scientific, and financial incentive systems, and challenges to long-standing practices to which scientists and institutions and publishers have all become accustomed and which they are resistant to abandon. New models of doing and publishing science must acknowledge the deep experience of contributors, attribute credit appropriately, and retain the benefits and rewards for those contributing original research. PLOS has already proven its ability to drive fundamental change in scientific communication. With a clear vision, sufficient dedication, and creativity and energy to execute that vision, PLOS is positioned to lead scientific publishing in these new and critically important directions. PLOS and Wikimedia share a common goal, an open web where communities come together to create, craft, use, reuse, and advance critical knowledge. PLOS and Wikipedia have come to that from different places and with different communities and bring different perspectives. And jointly, we are challenged to create and provide access to knowledge for the world as a whole not just for academic researchers and not just for professional scientists, not just for English speakers or residents of North America or Europe, but for every patient, every citizen scientist, every developer, every coder, every policymaker, every voter, farmer, industrialist, parent, child, for every person in the world. PLOS cannot do this alone, nor can Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. But if we continue to be inspired by one another to learn and observe and improve, then we will have advanced towards a truly inclusive and accessible commons for human collaboration and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, she will be available for a Q&A in the same spot uh, outside the press room in the foyer um, in just a few minutes. And uh, that wraps up our talks for today. We have a, a really amazing, fun, packed program for this evening. There's a comedy show, there's film screening, there's uh, music going on. So check your programs. Have an amazing time. I will see you in the morning. Good night.